Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku was a quirkless killer part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story Lita Cakes from Ao 3. So let's start the video. It was an accident. Really. The first time was genuinely an accident. Izuku had never meant to kill one of his friends. But no one had believed him when he said it was his fault. How could it be? He was quirkless. He didn't have a power that could hurt others. And he certainly couldn't kill anyone, right? Izuku was barely seven years old. No one believed that when he said Hibiki Nara's name, calling him from across the playground. The boy dropped dead instantly. Izuku's mother had laughed nervously when he said it and brushed him off as a worrywart. The next morning, Izuku woke up without the ability to speak. It wasn't for having lost his voice, not really. It was because he lost his head. He was blinking at the ceiling but he could tell he was on the floor. He didn't remember falling asleep on the floor. When he tried to roll over or sit up, nothing happened. Or rather, he was still staring at the ceiling, but he could feel his body moving. Panic set in, and he tried to scream, really, he did. But nothing came out. His mouth opened and there was no sound. His body fumbled to the floor. His vision went sideways as his head was knocked across the floor. That's when he saw it, his body. Headless and crawling around the floor like a newborn doe on shaky legs. He was alive, watching his body from a distance, as it struggled to find his head. Thankfully, the morning he woke up headless was a Saturday. His mother didn't come in to wake him up for school. He spent two hours struggling to grab his own head from the floor while panicking and silently screaming in horror. At seven years old, Izuku had killed a person and lost his head in less than 24 hours. But finally, finally, he grabbed hold of his detached skull and wiggled it back onto his neck by sheer force of will alone, as much force of will a child could muster, that is. When his neck reconnected, Izuku gasped. He hadn't realized he hadn't been breathing while his head was detached, but that made sense somehow. His mother came in shortly after but no matter how hard he tried to show his mother the horror he just endured, Izuku couldn't get his head to detach a second time. She told him to stop making up fairy tales and leave his weird dreams for his sleep. Nine years later Izuku crouched on a rooftop, watching the darkened city breathe. Streetlights changed, flickered around the edges of his vision as he observed the streets. It was around 1 am on a Friday night. Izuku was on patrol, or at least, he should be. But tonight, he had a meeting. Supposedly, there was some up-and-coming villain group that wanted to make a deal with the infamous vigilante, Dala. After Izuku discovered his quirk, and found no one who would believe him, he spent most of his childhood abused and bullied for his quirklessness and fairy tales about being a hero. He bore the scars to prove it. His friends had all turned into enemies. His mother started ignoring him because she couldn't have a normal conversation without him bringing up his imaginary quirk. So he put all his effort into training his quirk, and striving to become a hero. That failed when every hero school in the country refused him entry. His quirk had limits, which made it impossible to prove without compromise. He could only detach his head at night. Asking for a nighttime test had earned him laughs and shaking heads. He could, of course, just name a person and kill them, but he wasn't a murderer. Izuku didn't want to kill anyone, so he wouldn't use that kind of power. Plus, he'd get arrested. And that defeated the purpose of being a hero. So at 14, he decided to run away from all the people who'd abused him, and instead of bashing his skull on the wall of heroism, he became a vigilante. He'd been training for almost a decade, anyway. On top of that, Izuku was immortal. At least, he was effectively immortal. At night, when his powers activated, he could take any amount of damage, of any kind, and suffer no effect. He could be injured during the day, though. But he found his quirk had a pretty big healing factor outside of nightlife, which was useful. His death powers still worked regardless of the time of day, but he finally understood the activation requirements. He had to know and call out a person's true name with some kind of intent. His quirk activation had been a fluke, as manifestations usually were, but he still refused to use real names, ever. Izuku sighed. It was almost 1.30 when he finally stretched his arms above his head and stood up. The roof ledge was precarious but his balance was impeccable. Their meeting was taking place in the middle of Musutafu. With no assigned spot, Izuku had no idea how this supposed group of villains were going to find him. Perhaps they had a tracker. No, that didn't make sense. Izuku could sense when he was being watched or observed, and the direction of the observer. His sixth sense was off the charts for that sort of thing. He was in his full vigilante gear tonight, kitted out and ready for anything. Black cargo pants with a nice black dress shirt and dark green silk tie. He wore black combat boots and a long dark overcoat that made him look exactly like his vigilante namesake. The headless horseman from Sleepy Hollow. That was the aesthetic he strived for, at least. He had a large hood on the overcoat that shadowed his whole face and a black fabric mask that covered the lower half from below his eyes all the way down his neck. 
The mask had Velcro at his shoulders so he could detach his head if he wanted. But Izuku usually avoided that. So far, his vigilante name was a mystery to the world, as was his quirk. A swirling purple portal opened up to his left. Izuku unhooked the whip from his belt and took out his hunting knife with his free hand. Three bodies walked through as the portal closed behind them. A pale blue-haired man covered in disembodied hands, a goth-looking FC cur covered in burn scars, and a well-dressed man covered in twisting purple mist. Dullahan, the hand-covered villain asked, Who's asking? Izuku growled, We are the League of Villains. I am Tamura Shigaraki. This is Dabai and Kurajiri. Shigaraki was the only one of the three whose name rang true in Izuku's mind. His quirk told him that much. None of that reassured him that these villains were actually here to make a deal with him. On top of that, Izuku didn't usually make deals with villains. After all, he was out here to arrest villains, not team up with them. The only reason he'd considered it this time was their supposed cause. They were going after All Might, who was mentoring the class of heroes he'd be studying with if he'd been accepted at UA High. Dusty here is being dramatic. The scarred one, Dabai, tucked his hands in his pockets. Are you the one haunting the streets of Musutafu? Izuku relaxed his fighting pose and tucked his whip away at his belt. But he kept his knife out as an open threat. I am Dullahan. You weren't exactly specific with your intentions. What do you want from me? We're recruiting. Shigaraki called, putting his hands up in a sort of wide preacher pose. Izuku found it far too creepy to be any good sign. We could use the ghost of Musutafu on our side. We're going after All Might and all the false heroes on the charts. You're going to help us take them down. No, Izuku flipped his knife and put it back in the sheath on the back of his belt. This was a waste of time. He'd known the vague etchings of their goals, but now that he knew what they were fully after, there was no reason to be here. Excuse me, the hand-covered villain asked, his tone dark. I said, no, I have no intention of making myself a target of the heroes, nor do I have any reason to take them down. After all, I'm on their side, not yours. You're not a hero, jackass. Dabai rolled his eyes. You're like us, thrown to the rats and filth of the streets. Why not take a boot to the neck of every asshole that ever put you under theirs? Izuku scoffed. I'm nothing like you. Do you think you're better than us? Shigaraki groused. His teeth disgustingly sneered from under the large hand covering his face. What the hell was with the hands, anyway? No, I just don't need to kill heroes to feel good about myself. Dolahan, Dabai put an arm out in front of Shigaraki, stopping him from marching toward Izuku. If nothing else, we could use your help. You're known for your uncanny ability to sneak into anywhere, everywhere. Izuku sighed. What do you want? What's your price? Shigaraki brushed Dabai off. Tell me what and where it is, first. The UA school schedule for class 2A. Izuku barked a laugh. You think I can just waltz into UA high, and expect not to get caught, and somehow escape with not only a class schedule, but my ass intact? You're insane. You can't afford the price for that kind of retrieval. Name your price. She Izuku bit his lip. Look, handyman, you can't afford it, and I'm not doing it. That's a suicide mission. Name, your, price, the Hansi villain insisted. Izuku growled, deep in the back of his throat. Fine, if they wanted him to name a price, he'd name a damn price, a stupidly high one. 75 million yen. I also need transport in some weapons as a bonus. Done. Izuku narrowed his eyes. Not that they could tell behind his hood and mask. One more thing. You're pushing your luck here, ghost. Dabai grumbled. A name. A name. Shigaraki leaned his weight on one foot like he was jutting his hip out to the side. Annoyance on his face. What name? Izuku pointed at Dabai. His. You have my name. It's Dabai. No, it's not. I have a hunch about you, and I want your real name. This was an insurance policy. The whole time, Kirajiri had been silent and deathly still. He was nothing more than a butler, transport. He was likely not a hazard unless commanded to be, so Izuku wasn't worried about that. But Dabai had burning teal eyes that reminded Izuku far too much of a certain hero that had a fire quirk, burn scars, blue eyes, and a name meaning cremation. Yeah, Izuku had a hunch. Dabai scoffed. This is ridiculuo for FCK's sake, just tell him, Dabai. No one gives a shit about your real name or whoever you were before you burned up like bacon. You can whisper it to him if you're that embarrassed. Embarrassed. You're insufferable. Crusty, do you know that? Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Look, we agree to your terms. Money, transport, weapons, and Dabai's name. We need the schedule for next week of SAP, so you're going in tonight. That's impossible. I haven't even agreed to give the ghost my damn name. Dabai argued. Izuku and Shigaraki ignored him. You're going in tonight, Dullahan. No, I'm not. It's already past two, and I'm not risking a suicide mission with half a night to do my job. I'm going in tomorrow night. Meet me back here at 10 p.m. Ugh, fine. Shigaraki threw his hands up. As he turned away, a portal appeared beside Kirajiri. Before passing through, he slapped Dabai on the shoulder and grinned behind the face hand again. Go on, Dabai, tell him your name. 
We'll leave the portal open for you. Then he went through the portal with Kirajiri but the swirling purple gate didn't close, as promised. Dabai growled. Izuku could almost hear the villain's teeth grinding. Izuku leaned on the roof ledge, his arms crossed. He had all night to wait, and he didn't care how long it took. The longer this took, the more Izuku's hunch was proved valid anyway. Eventually, the villain spat on the floor between them and spoke. Talia Todoroki. Izuku grinned behind his mask. Yeah, that's what he thought. Tell Handyman he'll have his class schedule. I'll meet him here tomorrow night. He better have a down payment sent to me tomorrow before the retrieval. Half. Whatever. FCK off. You tell anyone my name, I'll FC King kill you. I have no interest in your family drama. I just wanted insurance. How is my name insurance? So long as you never cross me, you'll never need to know. Izuku dove off the building before Dabai could respond. He simply stepped off the edge and free fell to the ground. Were it daytime, he'd probably be dead, or at least gravely wounded. But because the sun had yet to rise, and his quirk was still active, Izuku landed on his feet without injury or trouble like a cat falling off a railing, always landing on its feet safely. When Izuku made it back to where he was living, a condemned apartment block, he printed out blueprints he found on the dark web that covered most of UA High. Of course, knowing the infamous Nezu was in control, the building construction likely changed often enough. This was reported to be accurate last year, so it would have to do for the moment. The class schedule would likely be found easily on one of the teacher's desks, or on their computers, both of which would be in the teacher's lounge. So, he had to get into the building and hope the halls hadn't changed so the path he was about to memorize would still be viable. This was dumb, incredibly stupid. His quirk allowed him to bypass any lock or door, sure. That was just a part of his nature. He'd learned that at a very early age, of course. His mother had always wondered how he continuously got into the snack drawer, despite keeping it locked so he wouldn't pig out on sweets. But even if he did get in, and got to the teacher's lounge, and got the class schedule, did Izuku really expect to get himself out of this massive school without being detected? Nezu's security systems were known to be the best in the country. The school also swapped to a dorm system for last year's entry class, the class he would have been in. The class he was now about to steal a schedule for, 2A. Dorms meant more security, and higher risks. Regardless of all that, Izuku did think he could manage it. His quirk allowed him entry past every security system and door, so he could get in without detection. And if he managed to get back to the doors he could get out. The problem was running around the halls without detection on the security cameras, given the Chimera's reputation. Izuku also assumed there would be pressure sensors and possibly other measures in place like atmospheric sensors or maybe even motion alarms. If any of that triggered when he went in, he'd get caught. Theoretically, his quirk could bypass all of that as they were considered locks in a way. But he was still a living, breathing person who could be seen on cameras and if the cameras had separate systems for detecting movement, he'd be screwed. Damn, Izuku sighed. This is suicide. But he spent the rest of his night planning out the mission anyway. When the sun came up, he checked all of his doors and windows were locked, boarded up, and alarmed, and went to bed. After running away, he'd become nocturnal as a result of his quirk and habits as a vigilante. It made his life easier, but it did prevent him from living a normal life, and any civilian work or excursions had to be done in the late afternoon so he could actually sleep most of the day. Izuku had gotten used to sleeping with a neck brace on, if only to prevent any accidents, or waking up with his head on the damn floor. Honestly, it was more embarrassing and annoying than inconvenient. He'd managed to master moving his body without his head. And despite losing his ability to speak or breathe while his head was detached, Izuku didn't struggle to think and he wasn't at risk of dying. Not any more than he would be on a normal day. Anyway, his routine was simple. Wake up, toss his neck brace aside, clamber out of his shitty bed and make some shitty coffee, drink it while reviewing news or an upcoming job, clean up, get dressed, and get whatever work done he had to do before heading out for patrol. Tonight there wouldn't be any patrol, though. He had to get ready for this stupid mission. Izuku rubbed his eyes and ran through his routine so he could get back to the work table and run through his plan twice more before the evening kicked off. Entry via portal into the grounds, then entry to the building by one of the staff entrances on the back of the building. Once through he'd have to find his way to the teacher's lounge. Then he'd have to either find a schedule on one of the desks, or hack into one of the teacher's laptops to get it, and then exit back the way he came. He didn't trust the villains to pick him up on time, so he planned to exit out the back gate, just in case his ride didn't show up. He sipped coffee while going over the plan in his mind several more times and getting his gear prepped. A fresh knife was set out on the table along with a second whip. He also wanted to take a small crossbody backpack with a few tools and his own laptop in case he needed it. Lastly, he'd need a new set of boots with the tread smoothed and black latex gloves to avoid fingerprints. His hair would also be wrapped up in his hood and a hat to prevent any DNA being left in the school upon his departure. 
The only questions that remained was his plan of attack should he be captured. He could play dead. That was his usual go-to. That's why he was often nicknamed Ghost. Too many villains had seen him die. They'd seen him fall off buildings, get stabbed and shot and a couple had even swore they'd seen him lose his head. Izuku smirked to himself. Honestly, it was sometimes just entertaining to watch the villains he routinely tormented and arrested squirm in discomfort as they dealt with the reality of killing a teenage vigilante. Then he'd show up the next night or a few days later in perfect health like nothing happened. 9.30 Izuku was back on the roof where he'd first met Shigaraki and Dabai. He had all his gear and felt mostly prepared to head into the madness he had somehow convinced himself he could accomplish. The city was quiet in the way cities were at night. The sound of traffic lights clicking and the rush of the subway trains were the only noise that filled the lack of voices and bodies. He often wandered up to the rooftops at night just to enjoy the silence and maybe think about the life he left behind. His mother never filed a missing persons report or came looking for him. No one at his middle school had made a scene when he stopped showing up the week before school ended. He hadn't left anything important behind, so there was no real reason to think about it, right? That didn't stop Izuku from feeling like he was missing out on something he could have had, perhaps in another life, maybe friends. The whoosh and swirl of a portal announced the villain's arrival. Izuku shook those silly thoughts out of his mind and slipped back into his vigilante persona. They'd done as Izuku requested and dropped off half the payment via portal earlier in the day, so Izuku was satisfied with moving forward. He was a little concerned they knew where he lived, but oh well. You actually showed. Dabai was the only one who walked through the portal. Well, you paid half. I earn my keep. Good. He reached back into the portal and pulled out a briefcase which was tossed at Izuku. Who caught it? Your requested weapons, and Kirijiri is on standby for transport. He'll drop you off and pick you up. Izuku nodded. He was fully geared up, and that left nothing of his face or body revealed like last night. But even more so as he had latex gloves on and a hat to add to the cover of his already shaded face. Dabai inspected his look for a while, as if checking for cracks or weak points in the fake armor he put on. There wasn't any cavalry, but Izuku felt shielded. He tucked the briefcase of weapons into a hiding spot on the roof and turned back to Dabai. Right, Kirijiri will bring you to our hideout when you're done. You better catch that portal or you're not getting paid and we're taking back what we already gave you. Get me? Yeah, I got you. Good. Wait for the portal to swap out and you're clear. Tell Kirijiri how long you need. Then Izuku was alone again. He took one last glance off the roof at the city. The portal shrunk into nothingness and spread open again. Izuku could see Kirijiri's bright yellow eyes at the very center. He was there, listening. Izuku could feel the weight of it on his brow. 26 minutes. No more, no less. If I'm 30 seconds late, assume I've been apprehended. The glowing eyes bobbed in agreement and vanished into the spiraling gate. Izuku stepped through. The feeling was heavy, like walking through thick fog. He was curious if maybe he'd find some moisture on his coat once he stepped through, but he didn't. When the world materialized, he was inside the UA grounds, in one of the forested areas at the back of the property behind the main building, which left him covered from view, for now. The campus was only slightly different from when Izuku toured it for the entrance exams almost two years ago. The dorms were a new addition, sitting in a couple neat rows along the back of the school. The main building, the giant H form covered in glass, sat imposing in the center. Izuku shook his head. He didn't have time to stand around. He clicked on his timer, 24 minutes, locked and loaded. He took out his whip but kept it wound in his hand, just in case. The staff door was right in front of him, and he was thankful Kirijiri had plopped in him the one tree-covered area near the main building. Izuku sprinted across the lawn to the door when the cameras turned away on their cycle. He took a deep breath and placed a hand on the door handle. His quirk was active, the lock clicked, he was through. First door down, 22 minutes remained. He was seriously wasting time. Izuku bolted through the halls, checking every corner for cameras and only moving when he was sure they weren't directed at him or where he was standing. There was no way to know for sure if he would get through this without being seen but he continued on, regardless. The hike up to the third floor and down to the end of the hall was quiet and uneventful aside from the camera avoidance. He made it to the teacher's lounge and placed his hand over the lock. Again, it clicked and he slid the door to the side. No door could bar a Dillahan from doing his job. No lock could stop him from getting to his goal. The lounge was dark, empty. He didn't spot any cameras in here, which made sense. But that didn't mean it wasn't alarmed in some way. If there were pressure sensors or motion sensors, he was screwed. But Izuku couldn't worry about that now. He had a job to do. 16 minutes. Izuku quickly inspected each desk in the room, finding only one out of order. Who the hell had a desk this messy? It was piled high with papers and folders. He could risk spending the time cracking into a laptop. Or he could try and dig into this desk. Izuku opted for the messy desk. Someone with a desk this nasty wouldn't miss or even notice the forms Izuku stole, would they? Why am I doing this? He muttered to himself. 
It took way too long to scan through all the paperwork on the messy desk. And just as he found what he was looking for, something clicked in the walls. Without his quirk, he wouldn't have noticed it. Something was watching him. No, someone was watching him. Up, to the left, there, the vent. Izuku narrowed his eyes. He glared at the vent grate for a long moment before realizing he was staring into the beady eyes of the very chimera he'd been trying to avoid the whole time. After a brief frozen moment, Izuku stuffed the schedule in his pocket while bolting out of the room and back down the hall. The school's alarm blared to life, all the windows shuddering and a few of the doors latching shut. Izuku didn't care. His cork didn't care. Every locked door he came to clicked back open for him and in minutes he was back outside. The portal was open, he could see it just beyond the trees. He pushed his legs harder, faster, but he could feel too many eyes on the back of his neck. Stop, a gruff male voice called. You're under arrest. That was a woman's voice. Izuku flicked his whip out and cracked it to one of the nearest trees to pull himself forward, to propel himself towards the portal. But he was too late. Something grabbed his ankle, yanked him backwards, and crashed his chin into the concrete. Fu's vision spun wild, upside down, sideways. His head was knocked clean off his shoulders from the force of his chin landing on the concrete. The screech and tear of Velcro filled his ears. Speech and breathing cut out, his body went limp. Maybe he could play dad, but he knew that would be useless. No normal fall would knock someone's head off. What the shit, eraser. The voice's voice again. Hey, you dot 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 what the FCK. I don't. I didn't dot 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 that's not possible. Izuku wanted to sigh. He sighed in his mind. There was no real reason to hide the truth now. He was caught red-handed and there was no way to escape. Eraser, midnight, what happened? Izuku actually recognized Nedzu's voice. Oh dear. Well, that's interesting. Izuku rolled his eyes. He couldn't see the staff with his head rolled to the side and facing the trees, though. For a split second he saw a portal open up. Shigaraki's head poked out. He spotted Izuku's lifeless body and grimaced before vanishing again. Okay, maybe he was off the hook with the villains, they thought he was dead. Shame, he'd lose all that money. Izuku's body rolled to the side and stood up under his command. What the hell? Izuku recognized Eraserhead's voice now. What a way to meet your hero. Oh my god, it's a zombie. Do you think my quirk will work on zombies? No no, midnight, dear. I think this is something quite. Other, if my hunch is right, the little vigilante isn't actually dead. I've been following him for a while now. Izuku wondered why they were speaking about him and not to him, but Nedzu quickly picked up on that. Can you hear me, Dullahan? His body grabbed hold of his head, easily lifting it and settling it back onto his shoulders with a twisting squelch and crack of his neck. Izuku gasped his breath back into his lungs. Yes, excellent. What a fascinating quirk. No one's ever bypassed my security system so effectively. You must tell me how you've done it. I didn't. Izuku stretched his neck and rolled his shoulders. Why was he telling them any of the truth? Well, they just watched him reattach his head so lying wasn't exactly going to help him or work right now. Speaking of what they just witnessed, Eraserhead looked horrified as he kept flicking his eyes between Izuku and Nenzu. Midnight had a hand to her mouth, confusion on her features. So, you really are a Dullahan. That's why I picked the name. Izuku grumbled, brushing his hood and hat off. He unstrapped his mask and took an easy breath. You're just a kid. Eraserhead finally snapped out of his shock. What of it? You're a kid. Why are you a vigilante? How did you get in here? Izuku sighed. He'd told them enough. He shut down and held his hands out for the coming handcuffs. Eraserhead shook his head and slapped a pair on his wrists as he heaved Izuku up off the ground. He was carted with a hand on his shoulder to an interview room of some kind in the administrative wing. The first thing they did once he was sat down was take the schedule from his pocket and search him. They took his whips and knives and told him to stay put. If Izuku wanted, he could just walk back out the door even after hearing the lock click, but he decided to obey. Why? Because he didn't actually feel like getting beat up by a bunch of hero teachers. Even if he could get through doors, that didn't do much for the wall of trained muscle prepared to recapture him. It would be stupid to think he could take on the UA staff on his own. One or two, maybe, if he really wanted to. But now that the alarms went off and the whole school was awake, there was no hope of getting past them all. They left Izuku alone for probably an hour or two. He couldn't tell exactly since there wasn't a clock in the room. Part of his quirk allowed him to tell time pretty impeccably, but it was never exact or to the minute. He felt like it was around 12.30, but it could be 1, maybe. When the door clicked open, Eraserhead walked in with Detective Tsukachi, a man he'd been avoiding for years. This detective was known for his arrest record and his ability to capture vigilantes. Well, that made his night a little worse. So, you're the infamous vigilante Dullahan, the ghost of Musutafu. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. Izuku sniffed the air. He knew this man's full name as it was public record, but he didn't plan to use it. Eraserheads was a deeply hidden secret to the public, so he'd have to do some digging if he wanted that, which he really didn't. 
After all, a name was power, and Izuku didn't want power over one of the few heroes he actually admired. Still, the man only stood by the door with his arms crossed and exhaustion on his features. Izuku ignored the hero for now. Likewise, detective, you know who I am. MMM. Well, that makes my life easier. Are you aware of my truth quirk? I am. Good. The man sat himself down across from Izuku and pressed record on a voice recording app on his phone. Interview 1, Detective Tsukachi Neyamasa, Eraserhead, and the Vigilante Dullahan. Please provide verbal answers to all questions. Let's begin. Izuku settled back in the chair, but the first thing he did was toss the cuffs on the table, unlocked and clattering across the metal surface. Tsukachi looked shocked but Eraserhead just clicked his tongue. He figured they would get to his methods of entry and escape soon. What is your given name? Tsukachi asked. Izuku shook his head. I don't use names unless absolutely necessary. You will not get mine until you figure it out for yourself. But you can call me Ghost if you want. Very well. We'll take a BLD sample and have your medical records pulled. You won't find much. Izuku grumbled. They might find his name, but his medical record said nothing more than quirkless. The doctors never cared to update it or bother with truly helping him for any of his wounds. How old are you? Izuku shifted awkwardly. 16. Where are your parents? Don't know. Don't care. Dad ran away when I was four. Mom never came looking for me. Their names. Izuku didn't respond. Tsukachi sighed. Tell us about your quirk. Ask Nedzu. He seems to think he has it figured out. He says your quirk is copying the ancient fey myth of the Dullahan, the headless horseman. Is that accurate? MMM. Ghost. I need a yes or no. It's accurate enough. The interview went on like this for probably half an hour. Tsukachi would ask a question. Izuku would either give him a vague answer, deflect, or refuse altogether. Eventually, they got to the point of this whole encounter, why he was here at the school in the first place. What was your mission here? Why steal a class schedule? Izuku didn't actually know the real reason. Or rather, he didn't know the importance it held to whatever mission the League was launching. But he never asked, and he didn't care. There was good money involved, which was now forfeit, and that had been all he needed to know going in. Come on, kid. We need to know what you were going to do with the information you stole. Izuku rolled his eyes. He shoved his mop of green curls back over his head and sighed towards the ceiling. I got paid for a retrieval, that's all. I didn't ask what it was for, and I didn't need to know. They let me set the price, and despite knowing it was likely a suicide mission, I was dumb enough to think I could pull it off. Almost did, too. Izuku glared at Eraserhead's capture scarf hard enough to make the man shift his weight from foot to foot. Tsukachi clicked off the recording and stood up. We need to speak about our options, we'll be back. Options. What options? They were going to try and put Izuku in jail and he'd escape. He'd never been put under Quirk suppressant but since he was fairly sure his Quirk was mutant type, he didn't really think they'd work much on him. Even without his Quirk, he was an expert at picking locks so he didn't really imagine a simple jail cell could hold him. The local joint they tossed the vigilantes and juvenile detainees into was far inferior to anything Nedzu could come up with, to say the least. They left him alone for another long while. He did close his eyes to nap for a bit only to startle awake when the door clattered open again. This time, it was a racer head with Nedzu on his shoulder, no sign of the detective. Izuku could feel eyes on the back of his head. The two-way mirror behind him was making the skin behind his ears prickle. So, Tsukachi was still watching, even if he wasn't in the room. Why did Uehai have an interrogation room? That was a damn good question. So, Nedzu hopped of a racer head's shoulders onto the table and paced back and forth in front of Izuku. We have two offers on the table, and each carries its own caveats. However, I have one question for you first, if you would be so kind as to indulge my curiosity for a moment. Izuku motioned for him to go on. The chimera grinned. Izuku shivered. Why, exactly, did you become a vigilante? Seriously? They wanted to know the why behind his actions. Izuku sighed. No hero school would accept a quirkless rent with a shitty record. No matter how forged that record might have been, designed to see me fail. It doesn't matter now. Just throw me in jail so I can go back to my life. You clearly aren't quirkless and there is no going back to the life you had before, kid. Stop calling me that, Eraserhead. I'm not a FC King child. You don't know anything about me. So kindly FCK off. The older hero sighed. I meant there's no going back to being a vigilante. You either take Nenzu's offer or you go to jail. It's that simple. Izuku barked a laugh. Throw me in there. See how long that lasts. Locks and doors don't affect me. What the hell does that mean? Exactly what I said. Figure it out. Ask Nedzu. I think he has some ideas, don't you, Chimera? Izuku had no issue using Nedzu's name. It wasn't his real name, after all. His quirk told him that much. MMM, I do. Izuku leaned forward, a devious smirk on his lips. Well, share with the class. We're all waiting. Eraser had rolled his eyes, clearly annoyed with Izuku's antics. Izuku scoffed, like he cared what some stupid hero thought of him. 
even if he admired this one above most of the others. None of them ever saved Izuku. He might technically be on their side, fighting crime, but he wasn't a hero, that's for sure. You are, quite literally, a dull hen. Nezu drew Izuku's attention again. You are a headless horseman, with all the abilities of one. Your quirk is fascinating. Can you remove your head for me once more? Izuku rolled his eyes. Of course morbid curiosity won out for the Chaos Lord. Nezu was quite infamous within the underground for how much of a mad genius he was. Still, the little vigilante obliged. Both hands to his temples, he twisted his head to the left and then off his shoulders. Eraserhead's face was horrified, but Nezu was grinning like a wild beast. Izuku was pretty sure that was the kind of look he should fear, but he didn't. Excellent. Considering your silence, I presume you cannot speak while your head is detached. Izuku blinked. Right. You can. He gestured to Izuku's neck. Izuku crunched his head back in place with a resounding crack as he adjusted his neck. I think I need some air. The tired hero across from him turned to leave the room, looking a bit green around the gills. Izuku chuckled when he finally got his voice back. Can't stomach a little decapitation, eraser head. The hero rounded on him so fast. Izuku actually leaned back in the chair. Eraser's hair was floating above his head, his eyes bright red, glowing, and his capture scarf in hand. You think this is funny? Yeah, kind of. It was, wasn't it? After all the years people made him feel uncomfortable, it was his turn to make them squirm and sick to the stomach. This is a waste of time, Nenzu. Just throw the brat in juvie and call it a day. I'm afraid we can't. What? Excuse me. Both Izuku and Eraserhead cried out at the same time, then proceeded to glare at each other. As I said, he's a genuine fairy myth. The dull hand is not stopped by any locks or doors. He cannot be barred from his duties. That's an integral part of the myth. It's why he got past my security system so easily. It's a part of what he is. Locks just don't work on him. Putting him in jail would just be providing a few days meals before he decided to walk out the front door. Izuku didn't respond to that. It was true and Nezu had hit the nail on the damn head. But Izuku would have preferred getting a few days of free meals before going back on the streets. At least he could have had a full belly for a few days. Had he finished this mission, he'd be rich or at least rich by his means. But that didn't happen, and he was now stuck in a room with a grouchy old man and a rat. Great, just great. I'm going to assume there are a ton of other facets to your quirk, and that you will tell us none of them. Well, they don't call you a mad genius in the underground for nothing, Nenzu. So, here are your revised options. The little chimera clapped his paws together and paced the table with renewed vigor. Revised, Eraserhead asked, coming over to slap his palms on the metal tabletop. Izuku ignored him. You go to juvie, for however long that lasts, and we keep catching you over and over as you escape over and over for the next, however many years, or... Izuku wasn't sure option 2 would be more fun, but he still listened, if only because he was too lazy to get up and leave yet or you stay here and become a hero student. The room was dead silent for all of 30 seconds before Izuku burst into a fit of laughter so hard he actually fell out of his chair and landed on the floor clutching his stomach. What a grand idea. Put the problematic vigilante into a class full of hero brats and expect him to learn to be a real hero. You wanted to be a hero bad enough that you became a vigilante. What was the point of that if not to be a hero in your own right? Izuku stopped laughing long enough to look up at Eraserhead. The hero was right, in a way. However look, Eraserhead. Izuku stood up and leaned on the two-way mirror behind him, right in front of Tsukachi, or at least where the observation ping was coming from. It moved a second later. I get what you're trying to do. You can't control me, you can't capture me, so you're trying to turn me into a hero that you can control. I'm not some goody two-shoes heroling that will prance around and ask how high. When the commission says jump, forget it. That's not who I am anymore. So, let's just go back to our fun little game of capture and release so we can all get some damn sleep. What do you mean by anymore? Nezu asked. Izuku ground his teeth. I'm not a stupid kid with a dream anymore. Besides, All Might crushed those dreams with his scrawny bare hands. I might not want to see the heroes fall, but I'm sure as hell not. A portal spun to life just beside Izuku. A large hand reached through. Izuku rolled to the side and popped up onto his feet in a fighting stance. Eraserhead smacked the alarm on the wall and rushed to his side. Shigaraki himself strolled through with a nasty grin behind his hand-covered face, as usual. So Kurajiri was right, you aren't dead. No wonder they call you Ghost. But sadly, you're a loose end that I'd like to tie up, so come along. FCKU, handy man. I told you, I don't team up with villains. But you're not above taking our money and stealing for us. Money is money, no matter how BLDY. Enough. The racer had barked. Shigaraki, you're under arrest. Surrender yourself and this won't be painful. Painful for who? The smiling demon asked. The most disgusting sensation of clawed fingernails slithered up Izuku's spine. He couldn't explain how he knew what was about to happen, but he knew, without a shred of doubt, that if he did not intervene, Eraserhead would die. Izuku's body reacted on instinct. Maybe that hero spirit he had as a child wasn't completely gone. 
He thrust himself between Shigaraki and Eraserhead, left arm up in a defensive pose. The villain grabbed his arm and pain shocked through it. He could feel the man's quirk tearing his flesh to shreds but he stood firm and grabbed Shigaraki's collar to prevent the villain from getting around him. Tamura Shigaraki His voice split in four, two high tones and two low tones, merging together to create the sound, the call, of death. And death came. The light faded from the villain's eyes instantly, and he dropped dead at Izuku's feet a second later. The portal vanished. No one moved. Izuku's arm was bleeding down his coat but he didn't care to stop it. This wasn't the first time he'd killed someone, nor even the second or third. But he still hated using his power this way. Even as a self-defense, he hated taking life. Perhaps that was silly. After all, he was a Dullahan. He was death-walking, chasing. He was the Knight Rider who came for those who were called to the depths of hell. Maybe it wasn't wrong to take Shigaraki's life, then. Maybe he was supposed to die, if Izuku deemed it so. Ghost. Something small grabbed his sleeve. Izuku jumped back and shook his head. He couldn't speak. He was too scared he would say someone else's name and kill them, too. It's alright. Nedzu said, calmly. You're safe. Can I have a look at your arm? Oh, right. Shigaraki's quirk. Izuku slipped his arm out of his coat and hissed at the pain. Nedzu carefully took hold of his hand to inspect the little circles of decaying flesh on his arm. It looked like someone took acid to his arm in the shape of Shigaraki's fingerprints. FC King Gross. His quirk is called decay, and I don't think it needs any further explanation. Izuku nodded. Yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Sukachi came rushing into the room with another officer, Sansa, on his heels. They were both guns drawn and ready to fight. The racer had kicked Shigaraki's body so it rolled onto its back. The kid beat you to it, Suki. Ghost took down Shigaraki. Yeah, let's have a chat about that. The racer head turned to him. How did you do that? But it was Nedzu who answered. In the myth of the Dullahan, the duty of the headless horseman is to ride to those whose time had come and announce their names to the four corners of the earth. When the name is spoken aloud, the person dies instantly. Names of power. Izuku repeated from earlier, his voice frail and quiet. So you just dot 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 said his name, and he died. Tsukachi asked. Izuku nodded. Your quirk comes with an insta kill. This time, Izuku shrugged. Well, Nedzu sighed. This isn't too bad. I'll need to have Recovery Girl clean out the decayed bits but otherwise, it doesn't appear to be getting worse. Does it hurt? Yes. Izuku growled. Nenzu, do you seriously want a kid with the ability to kill anyone just by saying their name in this school? It's not that simple. Izuku snapped at a racer head. Then explain it. Because you have given us a whole crock of nothing since you walked in here. It's not just about the name. It's the intent. I can say your true name just fine so long as there is no intention for you to die. But I still refuse to use anyone's real name, just in case. You only called me detective. But wait, you have been addressing Nenzu by his name. It only works if it's your true name. How did you know Nedzu wasn't my real name? I just dot 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 know. I can tell if your name is real or fake. The racer had looked him up and down for a moment before stepping closer. Nedzu gave him a wary look and Sukachi seemed unsure what to do. Izuku didn't back down from the weight of the hero's glare. My name is Aburo Shirakumo. No, it's not. My name is Tetsuya Ashikuro. The racer head, stop it. I don't shout Aizawa. Izuku shoved him backwards with both hands. I don't want your goddamn name. Do you understand what you've done? A name is power. You have given me power over your very being, to allow you to live or call you to death. I don't want that kind of power, and you can't take it back. Then give me your name in return. We'll be equal. No, Izuku shoved him again. Shouta stood firm. That boy doesn't exist anymore. I'm nothing more than a ghost chasing death. Just leave me alone, please. Nenzu tugged Eraserhead's pant leg as he walked toward the door. The adults filtered out of the room, leaving Izuku to himself and his battered arm. They took Shigaraki's body with them. This is what he wanted, wasn't it, to be left alone? After all, it's not like they could save him or stop him. He could leave whenever he liked unless they physically held him down with something he couldn't move that didn't have a lock on it. So why wasn't he leaving, then? Why hadn't he just walked out the door? There are several villains who tried and failed to capture and keep him over the years, an immortal plaything for their entertainment. But each time, they couldn't figure out a way to keep him locked up. So why, in Yue High of all places, was he struggling to push his legs toward the door? Izuku collapsed back into the chair with his head in his hands. Maybe Nenzu was reconsidering his offer. Maybe they'd just throw him in a hole and forget he exists. Maybe Izuku wouldn't hate that idea so much. It would keep him from killing another person, intentional or not. It would keep the world safe from the roaming ghost haunting the city. Izuku was so F-seeking careful, every moment of his life. But he could never be careful enough unless he just stopped talking. Maybe he should start carrying his head under his arm like the myths. He couldn't detach it during the day. But if he detached it at night, he could leave it detached without issue, aside from his loss of speech. Going back to the underground now would prove problematic. He just killed Shigaraki. 
and Izuku was fairly sure Kirajiri had seen it happen. He wouldn't get away with that, not without consequences. He had no idea who was funding this league of villains. But if they could pay Izuku's prices, there was no telling what they could do to Izuku for killing one of them. What a miserable weekend he was having. When Nedzu returned, he was alone. Izuku didn't feel any eyes on him besides the little chimera so the others must have been busy dealing with Shigaraki. Ghost. MMM. He was listening but he refused to lift his head from the table. I have an idea I'd like to run past you. Izuku tilted his head to the side, resting his cheek on the table to look at the principal across from him. The little chimera was poking his head over the table edge, standing on the chair. He nodded. The deal includes you giving up being a vigilante. You should know that first. Izuku wasn't sure if that was a deal breaker yet. The chimera went on. I would like you to stay here and become Aizawa's personal student to train in underground heroics. He only has one other personal student right now, and you would be one of only two going into the underground in this class. But I think it would suit you far better, and far more legally, than being a vigilante. Why would Aizawa want him as a personal student? Oh top of that, if that was the only offer now, why was Nedzu here delivering it, not the tired hero himself? Izuku wondered if he was outside the room fuming at Nedzu for even suggesting Izuku become his student. There were far too many questions regarding this offer that came to mind. But for now, the only important one was do I get off the hook for killing Shigaraki if I agree to this? I'm afraid the cameras were acting up in here earlier. The poor villain just mysteriously dropped dead. What a wondrous miracle. Izuku tried to hide the smirk on the corner of his lips, but he failed. Nedzu winked at him. He didn't want to give up being a vigilante. He didn't want to force himself to become a hero when heroes had only ever betrayed his trust and crushed his dreams. There were so many things pulling him back to that abandoned apartment, to the comfort and solace of his loneliness, even if the League came after him for killing one of their own. He didn't trust heroes. He didn't trust the society that had broken him down and crushed his dreams. Except except he'd figured out why he hadn't walked out yet. This was the most human interaction Izuku had had in years. And he realized while sitting here, alone, that he didn't want to lose it. Izuku liked being alone, but he hated being lonely. And there was a distinct difference between the two. Growing up, he'd only ever been lonely. Hated, picked on. No one had cared if he succeeded in life, or if he was just a kid that should probably be cared for. He knew Nedzu was just trying to put an end to one more vigilante, to stop one more illegal hero on the streets, but he wasn't trying to toss Izuku away. Yes, part of that was the inability to actually lock him up in jail because of his quirk, but not all of it. I need an answer, ghost. Izuku shook his head to clear the swirling thoughts. Why yes, I accept dot 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 if you'll indulge one condition. What's that? The person I was is dead, destroy my file. Or at least have me pronounced deceased. Nedzu gave him an odd look. Are you sure? That's all you want. It's a bit of a big request, isn't it? I'm afraid Izuku Midoriya was pronounced dead eight months ago. Oh, Izuku leaned back in the chair. So, his mother had filed a report of some kind, but no one cared to look. Enough time had passed and she had him pronounced dead. The posthumous pronouncement did nothing for her. He was quirkless on registry and therefore did not warrant a stipend from the government like any other kid would if they died under mysterious circumstances. Izuku wasn't shocked that Nedzu knew his name, or who he was. He'd already stated he'd been following Dillahan for a while now, and Izuku hadn't tried to hide his face once captured. Plus, Nedzu likely stole a sample of his BLD while inspecting his arm, which only confirmed his identity. I will need to give you a new identity, though. But we can worry about that later. I'm still willing to indulge one condition if you'd like to pick something else. Um, no, whatever. Izuku rubbed his hands over his face. I need my shit from my apartment. I assume I'm not allowed to leave campus now. Not for a while, no. I will have your belongings brought to you. Come along. Let's get you settled in. You will be guarded for the first few days while you get acclimated. You mean I'll have a watchdog to make sure I don't kill anyone? Izuku grumbled. Nedzu didn't respond. He followed the principal out of the interrogation room. The hall outside was full of life. Tsukachi and Aizawa were off to the side, talking quietly. Officer Sansa was by the door, back straight and eyes on a swivel. Standing across the hall from them was ectoplasm and midnight. Izuku had only seen them in passing on the news. He never really met them before. Ectoplasm will be your guard for the next few days. Midnight, could you take our little ghost here to get checked out before Ectoplasm takes him back to the dorms? Of course, Nedzu. Come on, sweetie, let's see to that arm. Aizawa looked up from his conversation long enough to give Izuku a hardened glare, which the vigilante returned with just as much vitriol. They were not going to get along, not right away at least. The racerhead was a hard-ass hero, and Izuku had heard his teaching style was similar. Izuku was a rock in the dryer, making noise and dents constantly. The tired hero probably hated that, but Izuku didn't plan to change himself to suit the needs of his new teacher. FCK that. Leave the bandages on for a few days, and you'll be fine. 
recovery girl planted a kiss on his forehead, activating her quirk. A rush of relief spiraled down his arm, taking the pain from the decayed flesh on his arm. Izuku nodded his thanks and walked back out to meet Ectoplasm once the nurse dismissed him. Midnight had vanished, probably to go back to her job. The hero teacher stared him down for a moment. At least, Izuku sort of assumed he did. It was really hard to tell with that helmet mask thing on his face. Izuku blinked a few times but waited to see what the teacher would say. In the end, he said nothing. A clone split off in the pair of Echidplasms. Echidplasmy. There was one on each side of Izuku as they led him out to the dorms. A member of Klasa was expelled last year. You'll be taking his place. Izuku wasn't sure which ectoplasm had said that, the original or the clone. Actually, which one was the clone? Izuku wondered if they were identical on a genetic level. Maybe both of them were clones dot 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 or neither of them were. Okay, that line of thinking was giving him a headache. Oh, the boy was found peeking in the girls' locker rooms in the dorms while it was occupied. Should you be telling me this? Izuku asked. I mean, FCK that kid. He'll end up becoming a villain, but like dot 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 why tell me? Aizawa, and by extension Nenzu and Yue, have a zero-tolerance policy for any kind of villainous behavior. Cool, I'm not a villain. I'm also not a pervert. Shouldn't be an issue. Ectoplasm made a sound that could have been taken as a grunt, but it was too. Bubbly, what did that mask do to his speech, anyway? Izuku had far too many questions. The hero led him to the two dorms and Izuku stopped at the end of the walk, feet frozen on the sidewalk. Absolutely not. He figured they'd be putting him with the teachers, you know, to guard him. Or maybe in a visitor's dorm, where he wouldn't be stuck with a whole building full of assholes his age who would be more than willing to bully him like always. Oh hell no. Izuku threw his hands up. Ectoplasm stopped and turned. Izuku had no way to know what the man's face was doing or if he was asking for an explanation. Already giving up, kid. Aizawa walked up behind him with a travel mug in hand and a smug grin on his face. You're not putting me in a student dorm. This is ridiculous. Aren't you the ones worried I might kill someone? You're my student now, which means you live with your classmates just like everyone else. No special treatment, even for vigilantes within Stock Hills. Izuku growled with his hands clawed in front of his face. Why if seeking bother? You know I could just walk out the gate if I wanted to, but you won't. Aizawa leaned forward with one eyebrow arched up. Unless you want to prove Nedzu wrong. He seems to think your abilities would benefit the good guys. And you yourself said you're not a villain. So please, prove us wrong. The man made a sweeping motion towards the back gate of the campus, which was about 20 yards to their left. Izuku ground his jaw. This man was going to be the death of him, the absolute death of him. There was no way he would let them think he was some common criminal. And there was certainly no way he was going to walk back out there to certain death for killing Shigaraki. Not yet, anyway. With a huff, he turned back to ectoplasm and gestured aggressively towards the dorms. Aizawa followed them. The sun was coming up over the horizon. It was probably almost 7 in the morning. Hopefully Hirling slept in on Sundays. Your stuff was moved into your room while you were with Recovery Girl and Midnight made sure you had all the necessities. Thank her next time you see her, hum. Izuku grunted at his new teacher, agreeing that he would without actually saying it. Aizawa grabbed the door handle and swung the door wide, leaving Izuku to stumble on the porch with his guard dog behind him. What all right hell spawn, listen up. Oh, great, no such luck. Hirolings didn't sleep in on Sundays. You've got a new classmate. He turned to Izuku and mumbled. What exactly am I calling you? Ghost. Izuku grumbled. That's not a name. Izuku glared at Aizawa, refusing to look at the students inside the building. He was just to the left of the door and still unseen. There was a bit of commotion starting up inside. Voices and mutterings as they waited for their teacher to announce the new student. Everyone say hello to Ghost. Don't bombard him with questions. I've got grading to do. Ectoplasm is staying with us for a few days while our new problem child gets acclimated. The older hero went inside, calling over his shoulder, if you need me, don't need me. He does care. Ectoplasm whispered over Izuku's shoulder. He's just a literal hobo. Izuku grumbled. He used to be my favorite hero. Now I just wanna. He made a strangling gesture. Ectoplasm chuckled. Hi. Izuku stumbled back from the door when a girl's face popped around it. She had short cropped brown hair and rosy cheeks, and a smile that could rival the sun. Izuku was blinded, and not in a good way. Behind her, a tall guy with glasses and dark blue hair was waving with these choppy motions. Welcome to Class 2A, Ghost. Is that your legal name? Anyway, I am Class President Tenya Ida, and this is Ochako Uraraka. It's a pleasure to meet you. Please, come in. The girl, Uraraka, bounced outside. She went for his arm, the wounded one, but Izuku's brain just sort of melted. He reacted on instinct. His leg kicked out, grabbed her ankle while his good hand grabbed her arm and pushed her sideways into an armbar with her leg kicked out. Uh, what the hey, I was just trying to take your hand. Ghost. Ectoplasm warned. 
Oops, sorry. Izuku released her a second later, when he realized what he'd done. It's good to see you have hero training, but why did you do that? Ida asked. Hiroraka was busy rubbing her arm. Izuku didn't really know how to answer that. To say the truth, he was just accustomed to being greeted with violence. Bullies, villains, other vigilantes, civilians, even. Izuku had never really been given kind physical contact. Nor did he expect it from anyone, ever. My arm is injured. I just reacted. He shrugged. Oh, I'm sorry. Uraraka bowed. I hope I didn't hurt you. Izuku blinked. Um, no. I'm fine. Ectoplasm ushered them all inside and closed the door while they spoke. Wait, where did his clone go? Izuku was seriously going to have a constant headache around this hero, wasn't he? You're obviously not from UA. So which hero school did you transfer from? Uraraka kept the conversation going. Izuku wished she wouldn't. More students were filtering into the common room, which just looked like a big open space with a sitting area, TV, study tables, and a few bean bags and games laying around. The kitchen and dining area was off to the back left, with an elevator and entrance to the dorm rooms to the back right. Izuku had no idea where his room was, or where anything was, actually. I didn't. Izuku explained while looking around. There were a few students on the couches by the TV with eyes on him but they didn't seem keen on coming over, they looked shy. One had the head of a bird, one looked like his head was made of rocks, and the other had several extra limbs. Interesting. He spotted a girl with a possible frog quirk studying off to the right, along with a cute girl wearing his hair and a giant ponytail. There was also a set of floating clothes, which Izuku attributed to an invisibility quirk, a girl, maybe. The kitchen was full, probably the late risers making breakfast. A redhead with shark teeth was cooking eggs while a bright pink girl quietly danced nearby with headphones on. How many students were there? He didn't, what? Ida asked. He didn't transfer from a hero school. I didn't attend hero school or high school. I don't think I graduated middle school, technically. He assumed Nedzu knew since he'd pulled the vigilantis records. So if he was fine with it, Izuku wouldn't care. Wait, what? That's but, you can't have been accepted into UA without I wasn't accepted. Izuku grumbled. This isn't a reward, class president. I'm a prisoner. Ectoplasm sighed. You're being dramatic. Come along. I think you've said enough for the time being. He ushered Izuku towards the back of the common room, leaving Uraraka and Ida in stunned silence. How many hero brats do I have to get along with? 19. You don't have to get along with them, you just have to work with them. I can live with Thadi Eku. Izuku's feet caught on the rug. Ectoplasm nearly lost his footing when Izuku froze up. A rush of fear crept up into his gut from somewhere dark and buried. That voice grated his ears to the point of pain just behind his eyes. There was no FC King way he was being put in the same class as FCK this. Absolutely not. Tell Aizawa he wins. I'll prove him wrong. FCK. This. He turned on his heel to head right back out the door but someone grabbed him, and it wasn't ectoplasm. Izuku yanked his hand free. What the hell are you doing here, Deku? Katsuki Bekugo asked. Izuku growled. Call me that FC King slur again and you'll see why the hell I'm here. Katsuki actually took a half step back. You two know each other? Ectoplasm asked. Yeah. Izuku's lip peels up in disgust. We know each other, don't we, Kaken? The blonde winced at the mocking use of his old nickname. We grew up together. Best friends forever, weren't we? Izuku elbowed him out of the way and Katsuki didn't stop him. Where the hell is Aizawa? Right here. What's going on? The teacher rounded the corner. This farce is over. Tell Nedzu to toss me in juvie. There's no F-seeking way I'm being put in a class with him. Izuku gestured to Katsuki without using his name. Why is that? Izuku scoffed. Why don't you tell them, Kaken? The class was starting to crowd around them or peek around the couches from the common room. Izuku crossed his arms and settled his weight on his right hip. The blonde didn't seem capable of answering. His face was an open wreck of shock and hurt. Izuku didn't care. He deserved it, and worse. Actually, I have a better idea. Izuku tossed his coat on a nearby chair and walked back to Katsuki. He leaned down enough to force the blonde to stare him in the eyes as he unbuttoned his shirt. Katsuki's eyes widened in horror knowing full well what Izuku was about to show off. A second later, he grabbed Izuku's collar, stopping his hands but this time, Izuku didn't snap back when touched. Don't. Katsuki gasped. Izuku slapped his hand away and growled in the blonde's face. It was a mirror to what Katsuki used to do to him. He ripped his shirt open and grabbed Katsuki's chin. Aizawa's hand was on his shoulder a second later but Izuku ignored him. What kind of hero can't stomach their own quirk? He used his free hand to shrug the shirt down his arms, leaving his scar-riddled skin open for the whole room to see. Starbursts covered his shoulders, chest, and back. The large handprint on his left shoulder sat proud and red on his skin, even fully healed. Ghost. Aizawa's voice was hesitant. How ask him? Izuku barked. Ask Kaken how I got the scars. Ask him about Alder in middle school. Ask him about gym class. Ask him what his quirk feels like on human skin. I bet he can't tell you, but I sure as hell can. 
Katsuki was quietly crying by the time Izuku finished speaking. He threw Katsuki's face backwards, making the blonde stumble and land on his ass on the carpet. You're accusing it's not an accusation, erase her head. Izuku put his coat back on and shouldered past his new teacher but the man grabbed his shoulder to stop him again. Izuku snarled, glaring up at the man who dared try and call his bluff. Well, it wasn't a bluff, so he was shit out of luck. Nedzu asked me why. He asked me why I became a vigilante. A few gasps and murmurs filled the room around them. You wanna know why? Izuku pointed at Katsuki. Because he told me to throw myself off a roof. With a sneer, he practically hissed the next sentence. So I did. What a shame it didn't work. In truth, Izuku hadn't been sure if it would work at the time. He'd discovered his quirk at 7. But by 14 his dreams were shattered and that roof looked too good to refuse. He figured if he jumped during the day, when his quirk wasn't active, he could die. Well, he'd been wrong. He had to lay there for hours while his body knit itself back together, but he didn't die. Move. Now, Aizawa snapped him out of his thoughts. Ectoplasm. Take Bekugo to his room and stay with him. Ghost, with me. Izuku was being pulled by the arm. The clamor of students' complaints and requests for information followed them down the hallway. Aizawa grabbed a random door and shoved them both inside before slamming the door shut after them. This must be his newly assigned room since all his stuff was in here. Izuku's shoulders finally dropped a little, unseen tension finally releasing now that he wasn't being stared at by three dozen pairs of eyes. Oh, that's what hit him on edge. Too many observation pings crawling across his skin. Why didn't you tell us about your history with Bakugo? How would I have known what class he was in? I didn't even know if he'd been accepted to UA. I left middle school before graduation. I purposefully tried to forget that life. I didn't follow him on FC King Facebook, Eraser. The teacher sighed. I should have given you a class roster. Probably. But we're a little past that now, don't Cha think? Aizawa pinched the bridge of his nose. Izuku could see the gears turning in his head as he debated what to say. Izuku grabbed the desk chair and collapsed into it. FCK, what a weekend. He really needed to get a handle on his whirlwind emotions or this was not going to get any easier. It's dot 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 I in the past. I shouldn't have caused a scene. FCK it. Just forget it. We're a little past forgetting, kid. Aizawa mimicked his words. It was years ago. Eraser. Less than two. You cannot just show the whole dorm scars caused by another student and expect us to just let this go. There's no closure for something like this. It doesn't matter what you do to him, he clearly regrets it. I've never seen him cry like that. Not since we were toddlers. He can say he's sorry until he's blue in the face. It won't change what happened. Ghost, he hurt you. He needs to face consequences for that. Izuku sighed deeply. Yeah, he'd like Katsuki to face some damn consequences. But would that really make him feel better? Not at all. On top of that, if Izuku burned Katsuki down for what he did, would that really make him any less villainous than his former classmates? He hurt me under the direction of every adult in our lives. If you take that out on him, you'll be no better than them. Would I like an apology? Sure. Will that change that my teachers made classmates use me for target practice? No. If he acts like that with his friends, how can I expect him to be a hero? If you treat him like a villain, then that's all he'll ever be. Trust me, I understand that better than anyone. I can't just let him off the hook, kid. That's not how this works. He used a quirk on you. Yeah, he did. So did 15 other students and several teachers. I was registered as quirkless. That's life for us. He was taught what he did was right. That doesn't negate his responsibility for his actions. Don't you think I know that? Izuku shoved the chair back as he stood up. I hate him. I want to hurt him. I, I could so easily just say his name and... I could have done it a hundred times in the last ten years. Izuku took a shaky breath. But what good would that do? What good does it do anyone to punish him for what he was taught was acceptable? Abusers shouldn't be heroes. Izuku barked a shrill laugh. Is that so? Really? Why don't you go tell Endeavor that? Or maybe All Might? How about native or even death arms? I could give you a laundry list of abusive heroes. At least Kaken seems to regret what he did. None of them ever said sorry for their actions. The Hero Commission just covered it all up. How do you how do I know? Izuku cut Aizawa off. Well, I happened to meet Endeavor's long-lost dead son the other day. All Might personally left me on a FC King roof the same day Kaken told me to kill myself, which was just after I was attached by a villain and received no medical care. I could go on. The point is there is no real meaning to the word hero anymore. I can't speak for what the Hero Commission does, no matter how much I wish I could change it. But I can change how our next generation acts as heroes. Izuku paced the room with his hands on his head. Aizawa hadn't moved from his place by the door with his arms crossed tightly on his chest. The man's expression was hard, but Izuku could see there was actual concern in his eyes. Then do better. Be better than the teachers we've had in the past. Don't punish him, teach him, change him. Aizawa rolled his jaw, his teeth grinding in frustration. Izuku stared at him with an expectant look for a solid five minutes before the hero spoke. If I promise to be a better teacher than you've had before, would you stay? 
Izuku was still unsure why they all cared so much if he stayed or went back to being a vigilante. Obviously they don't want another vigilante out there doing illegal heroics. But why did they care about Izuku so much? Was it just because he was still a teenager? Again, far too many questions and not enough time or energy for all of them. Yeah, sure, whatever. Just don't make me work with him on group projects. I think I can manage that. Can you be civil with him? You mean can I be in the same room with him and not say his name with the intent to kill him? Yes, yeah, I can be civil. Aizawa nodded. But he is going to apologize to you. And he's going to be put in some kind of anger management or something. I'll figure it out. Okay, try to relax for the day, kid. The tired hero left. Izuku spotted one of Ectoplasm's clones outside the door as he left. So, he was still being guarded. Well, he didn't expect them to just trust him after they watched him detach and reattach his head dot 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 and the whole dot 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 dead body thing. Yeah, he shouldn't expect them to trust him one bit. Izuku stripped his vigilante gear and tossed it in the laundry hamper, he'd wash it later. He grabbed a pair of workout shorts and an old t-shirt and flopped on the bed. What a mess he got himself into. His whole routine would have to change. Shit, he'd have to swap off nocturnal living if he was supposed to go to school or was he supposed to go to school now? Izuku groaned as he tucked an arm over his face. He was exhausted but if he went to sleep now, he wouldn't function tomorrow, when he'd really need to. So, he'd have to force himself to stay awake all damn day, so he could sleep tonight. That meant he couldn't lay around in bed all damn day. Ugh. Izuku's stomach was growling in protest. When did he last eat? Probably before the mission, which meant like 12 hours ago. He should get food, but that would require him to first ask Ectoplasm if he could raid the kitchen, and secondly, actually raid the kitchen. There are far too many people in this building, and although Izuku knew no one was staring at him right now, he still felt watched. Okay, there was a high probability Nenzu was somehow watching him, but outside of the freaky chimera, he knew he wasn't being watched. His quirk didn't seem to care about the logistics of it. He was getting a damn headache all over again. In the end, exhaustion won out. Izuku set an alarm on his phone and took a 45-minute nap. Once he was up, he felt slightly more energized. Except when he woke up, he wasn't alone. The feel of eyes on his right shoulder made his head snap around. Katsuki was standing on his balcony with the door open, body stiff and his arms crossed so tight Izuku worried he might damage his uniform shirt. We need to talk. Izuku hoisted himself to his feet so he could open his laptop on the desk across the room. He mostly ignored Katsuki while logging into the Wi-Fi and checking a few important things like his email and the police bands. Yeah, guess we do. He finally replied. Katsuki didn't move. Izuku stayed hovering over his desk. Eventually, he ran out of shit to check and closed his laptop. He walked over to the blonde and leaned on the balcony doors beside him. Neither of them looked at each other. They shared the small space in silence for a few minutes, staring out across campus. Izuku hadn't seen Katsuki in almost two years, since he ran away before the end of middle school. Everyone probably believed he was dead. And then his mother got him pronounced dead eight months ago, so maybe he was, in a way. Izuku was curious if Katsuki believed he'd actually taken that jump all this time. He did. It just didn't work out the way Izuku had planned. I'm sorry, Katsuki whispered. The afternoon sun was bright in their eyes, and even with the lazy breeze coming across their faces, Izuku still felt blindsided by the sudden apology. Aizawa had sworn he'd make Katsuki do it, but Izuku didn't think he'd had time to talk to the blonde yet. Judging by his entry on the balcony, it was more likely he was avoiding an order to stay away from Izuku for the time being. So maybe Aizawa hadn't talked to him yet. I don't forgive you. Izuku sighed. I don't think I know how. I know. Katsuki shifted awkwardly, changing which foot his weight rested on. I don't expect you to, ever. But you still deserve to hear it. Only if you mean it, Kaken. I do. No hesitation. Good. Have you changed? Yeah, I think so. I'm trying to. You know how my quirk is. Izuku nodded. Even if he changed his whole personality, his explosion quirk would always give him a short fuse and biting tongue. Izuku finally lifted his head to face Katsuki. Their eyes met and Izuku found some strange form of tenderness within them. Izuku knew, deep in his soul, that he would hate Katsuki for the rest of his life. He knew that, and yet there was some strange intimacy in knowing that they were both bound by BLD and scars. Even if Izuku spent the rest of his life imagining the way Katsuki's name would feel in his mouth with the intent to kill, even if he imagined the light fading from those ruby irises a hundred times, there was a comfort in knowing he had that power over one of the people who hurt him most in the world. Judging from the distant look filling his eyes, Izuku was fairly sure Katsuki knew it, too. You really jumped. Izuku nodded. I got attacked by that sludge villain. All Might intervened. Long story short, I got dropped on a roof and told my dreams weren't realistic. That was the same day you, you know, All Might told you he dot 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 what a FC king asshole. Yeah, Izuku shrugged. 
Anyway, it didn't work. Six hours on the concrete while my body stitched itself back together and I'm still kicking. I'm glad. I know that doesn't change anything between us dot 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 but I am glad you're alive. Yes. Ghost. Izuku sighed. I did die, in a way. But I think we all do that a few times in our lives. You did too, didn't you? Katsuki grunted his agreement. Yeah, in a way, they had both died and become new people. What an odd realization for two 16-year-olds to have. Izuku shifted his shoulder against the door, watching a few students meander across campus. The weather was nice. Izuku actually missed being out during the day. He was a creature of the night now, but the sun still felt warm and comforting on his skin for the first time in ages. Katsuki interrupted the silence again. So, you're not quirkless? Izuku shook his head. No, my quirk, it, it makes me sort of immortal. Sort of? Like I said, I spent a nasty six hours on the pavement when I jumped. I still get hurt, it just heals me. Though, at night, Izuku clicked his tongue. It's like I'm a phantom, a ghost. Katsuki mumbled. MMM, my vigilante name is Dullahan. That's basically what I am. What? Some creepypasta death freak. Izuku chuckled. Yeah, I guess so. It's a fey myth. They're one of the heralders of death. The headless horseman. My quirk is pretty spot on. Pulled up. Katsuki pushed off the balcony door. You're saying you can. What? Detach your head or some shit. Well, yeah. That's one thing I can do. I can also bypass any lock or door. It's why I'm here. They can't throw me juvie. I'd just walk out the front door. I can also call a person's true name and kill them instantly. You. The blonde froze. His eyes widened in realization. The truth was, Izuku hadn't always called his best friend Kaken. He started calling him that after their quirks manifested. After Hibiki's death, when Izuku started acting weird, and the bullying began when they all thought he'd never manifest a quirk. You've never dot 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 you always had these dumbass nicknames for everyone that's why. I was scared I would kill someone else. Someone else. Hibiki-kun. Is of CK. That wasn't your fault. But it was. That's the day my quirk manifested. The next morning I woke up with my head on the ground and my body floundering around like a dead fish. By the time mom found me, I'd fixed it, and she didn't believe me. No one did. I killed Hibiki. Katsuki was silent, his eyes fixed on the ground with burning intensity. Izuku sighed. I could have killed you a hundred times. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should have done that to a lot of people. Izuku rubbed a hand over his face, feeling another wave of exhaustion come over him. But I was never the villain, was I, Kaken? No, Katsuki didn't hesitate. I was. Two days later, Izuku rubbed a hand over the side of his face, exhausted. The change in sleep schedule was still hitting him hard, but at least he was better off than his first weekend. It was now Tuesday evening. Class 2A, for the most part, were all relaxing in the common room while eating dinner. Apparently Tuesdays were taco nights. Everyone helped out. And when they finished, they all sat down around the couches and put movies on low volume while chatting about a variety of subjects. Izuku was still learning everyone's names. And he didn't really intend to learn them all, just as a precaution. Actually, he was taking more to Katsuki's nicknames than any of the class appeared to enjoy. Currently they were having a debate about the villains that infiltrated their school the year before, twice. This was before Izuku had even heard of the League of Villains. And they didn't become a household name in the underground until earlier this year. They were mostly defunct now that Izuku had killed their leader, but none of the students knew that. The Racerhead had given him a report about their movements and the underground had shifted a lot in only a couple days, which was scary. Izuku knew he'd face consequences for what he did, but he was currently trying not to think about it. Oh come on, you can't tell me Dabai isn't evil. Momo and Ida were having a debate about the League's intentions and ideologies. Leave it to the smartest cookies to bring moral ideologies into the conversation. Izuku rolled his eyes. I don't believe any villain is truly evil, except maybe Shigaraki. They're still just human. Izuku actually agreed with Ida on that one. Shigaraki was. Something else. Or well, he had been. Evil seemed like a good word for what Izuku felt slithering its way out of Shigaraki's aura. But Dabai did try and burn us all to death at summer camp, and he kidnapped Bekugo. Achako pointed out. Wait what? Izuku perked up, looking at the spiky blonde next to him who was sporting an annoyed scowl. You had to bring that up, pink cheeks. It's fine, ghost. The league just roughed me up a bit, nothing I didn't deserve. Oh we're gonna talk about that in a minute, Kaken. But first he leaned over the back of the couch towards Achako. He was sitting on one of the counter stools next to Katsuki behind the couches. What really makes you think Dabai is evil, though? Just his willingness to kill. Anyone can do that, you don't have to be evil. Good people can kill, too, for very good reasons. Heroes don't kill. Tailman insisted, said Tail flicking angrily by his side. Izuku rolled his eyes. Right, that's why Endeavor has an off-the-charts capture-to-kill ratio. The worst in the country. Worst in this country's history.
Actually, he kills at least seven villains for every one he captures. Every eye in the room was suddenly looking at one student. Said student, who Izuku didn't yet have a name for, had half red, half white hair. He was sitting on the floor beside the coffee tables, munching a bowl of mixed taco salad calmly. He looked up when he noticed all the eyes on him. What? The teen asked. Did you know, Ribbit? Sue asked. Know what? That my father was a murderer. Sure, he killed my older brother. Izuku's brain stopped working. Like he actually felt the gears grind to a halt. He was pretty sure several other students had the exact same experience. But not for the same reason. How stupid could Izuku be? Of course that was the youngest Todoroki. That bright teal eye, the fire quirk. Izuku had been tripped up by the white side. But that could easily be from his mother, couldn't it? Izuku didn't know their whole story. But he was damn sure it wasn't pretty. You're his brother. The words came out before he could stop them. Izuku slapped his hands over his mouth. Suddenly, all eyes were on him. Whose brother? Todoroki asked. Nope. He was not going to have that conversation. That was most certainly not his place. Absolutely FC King not. But Katsuki put his damn combat boot into it, like he did everything else. The blonde was too smart for his own good. What the foo? Oh my god. Katsuki glared at him. No. He leaned back. Nuo. How did you he told me? Izuku shrugged. It was part of the deal that landed me here, his true name. Whose name? Ida asked. What's going on? Who are you talking about? Mina asked, ever the gossip, but not in a bad way. Todoroki set his taco bowl down and looked up to Izuku. Actually, quite a few students did. Izuku felt far too observed once again. The last couple days he could get by with knowing he other teens weren't actually staring at him, but right now, it felt like 18 pairs of eyes were boring into his soul. Tell them, Katuski nudged his shoulder. Well now you gotta spill, ghost. Kirishima was on the edge of the couch, literally. Come Uwan, Achako insisted. You can't just leave us hanging like that. Izuku rolled his eyes. How could they not put it together? It was so simple in Izuku's mind. The same eyes, the same quirk, the rage and power. Dabai and Endeavor were more alike than most people realized. And probably more than the two of them realized either. Despite the annoying stares from his little heroing classmates, Izuku stood firm for a few more minutes. At least, until Todoroki gave him this curious look. Izuku sighed. Fine. He shifted a little in his chair. It's pretty simple, really. I can't dot 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 say his name. Here he gave Katsuki a look. The blonde twitched a little. But I mean dot 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 put the pieces together. Fire quirk, uncontrolled rage and anger. I mean dot 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 the biggest clue was the eyes. Color, sure, but the hate behind them is dot 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 all too real. The room was silent for a while. Everyone seemed to be piecing the madness together and trying to make sense of what Izuku had just said. He wasn't sure they would all quite catch it the first time around. But Todoroki did, surprisingly. But his reaction wasn't what Izuku expected. By a long shot. The dual-toned teen started laughing. He couldn't control it, so he put his taco bowl down and clutched his stomach. The laughter was weird, like he didn't laugh much at all, or even know how. Judging from the concerned looks around the room, Izuku assumed that was true. Great, you went and broke icy hot. Good job. Katsuki playfully jabbed his ribs harmlessly. Izuku rolled his eyes again. He's not broken. He's laughing. Why are you laughing? That's laughter. Zero asked, looking terribly confused. I think. I think so. Momo leaned down and tapped Todoroki on the shoulder. Um, are you okay, Todoroki? Why yeah? He snickered. It's just, he's alive. Again. He fell into a giggle fit before controlling it enough to speak after a few moments. Tao is alive, and he's a villain. It's too funny. It's so great. Endeavor is going to lose his shit. Then he couldn't speak anymore. He fell over and burst into laughter. Izuku couldn't stop himself. He started laughing, too. Todoroki was right. Endeavor was going to lose his ever-loving shit when he found out his eldest son was a villain. Izuku hadn't even thought about that before. Oh god, the look on his face would be priceless. He'd so need a picture of that, for a variety of reasons. The first being to sell to Jiren or a number of other villains, including Dabai. What's all the ruckus about? The racer had walked in the room while rubbing the side of his head and drinking from a travel mug, likely coffee. At this hour, it was like 7 in the evening. The rest of the class were in varying states of understanding. A few of them got the joke, the truth. They understood, and were trying hard to stifle their laughter. This was mainly Katsuki, Tsu, and Siro. The rest were showing a range of confusion and concern. Izuku waved a hand in front of his face and shook his head to the hero who walked in. Dabai is Icy Hot's older brother. The class didn't know, apparently. I may have just revealed state secrets. At least it wasn't All Might's secrets. What secrets? The racer had narrowed his eyes. Nothing. Let's circle back to how Dabai is a Todoroki. Oh we're going to talk about state secrets later. Now how exactly do you know Dabai is Endeavor's son? Oh, simple. He told me so. He told you. The racer had deadpanned. 
When, when Shigaraki was asking my price for stealing the Tua class schedule, a few students gasped. They knew he was a vigilante now, but they didn't know how he had gotten here, or why he was staying in their dorm, not yet anyway. Part of my price was Dabai's true name. I thought you didn't want names. Eraserhead was questioning his morals, he could feel it. Oh please, Eraser, we both know I needed insurance and collateral. This was a damn suicide mission, and I failed. Besides, now Icy Hot can blackmail his bastard of a father. Todoroki himself snorted so loud he had to cover his mouth. I can, he whispered. Holy shit, I could. A wide grin appeared on his face as he went back to his meal. Heroes don't blackmail their parents. Eraserhead grumbled. But I'm not against that plan. Sensei, Ida cried. Heroes don't use blackmail. Have you met Endeavor? Their teacher whined, like he actually sounded like a frustrated teenager for two seconds. Izuku tried not to laugh. He's intolerable on his best days. And try using his name as a colleague and he throws a fit like a child. I'm not in G, I'm Endeavor. Like you're actually a beach, I was just trying to be polite. Ugh, Izuku was going to fall apart. This was too great. Maybe being stuck with 19 other Tenigers wouldn't be so bad if their teacher was not actually an uptight asshole. He never thought Eraserhead was, but he came off as an uptight asshole when they first met. Now Izuku could see that was just part of his dark, mysterious hero persona when he was on duty. That's highly inappropriate, Sensei. Momo cleared her throat. But I must say it's quite true. Momo, Ida gaped at her. Izuku barked a laugh. What? I've met him a few times. You all know my parents are hero civil law lawyers. They'd made a lot of his mistakes disappear, and I never agreed with it. Oh have they? Where do they live again? Izuku asked. Eraserhead grabbed his shoulder. Izuku looked up to find the man glaring with his quirk activated, hair floating. What? I wasn't gonna break in, steal their files on Endeavor and release them online or anything. The man didn't even blink. Okay, fine. That might have been my plan. Why do you have to ruin my fun, Eraser? It's my job, I'm a teacher, and your warden. Izuku groaned. Eraserhead reached out and ruffled his curls, much to Izuku's annoyance. Alright, Hellspawn, I know you all have homework to do. Hop to it. Tomorrow is midweek, which means hero training, and you have a new student to test out. Izuku frowned. Oh don't give me that, ghost. I don't ruin all the fun, do I? Ugh, I'm not going easy on them, and I'm not fighting fair. That's not very hero-like. Ada mumbled. Well, then I guess it's a damn good thing I'm not a hero. He smirked. The class president looked conflicted as to what to do with that. The class knew he was a vigilante after his little episode with Katsuki, so they couldn't really argue him being a hero student. That had actually been an interesting night. After they spoke, they went down to make dinner since Izuku was starving. The class were incredibly silent and horrified at seeing the two of them speaking calmly and arguing over which way to make ramen. But eventually, the troublesome duo just came out and said they'd worked out their shit. The problems weren't solved, and Izuku would never forgive Katsuki for the things he did when they were kids. But, they had decided to move on, past it. It didn't make them friends, but they were classmates. They had to work together, even if they were still trying to find a way to like each other again. But, even if they knew he was a vigilante, they'd not yet seen him fight. They also hadn't seen his quirk, but he'd only been there three days. There was still time for them to find out the insanity that was his quirk. Actually, he had a pretty good idea about that. The evening wound down pretty fast after Eraserhead told them to get their homework done. Izuku didn't yet have homework since Nenzu was still crafting him a custom curriculum, but he did have other shit to worry about. Namely, what the hell was going on in the underground. So, by 10 o'clock, Izuku was waist deep in the deep web, trolling the worst forums looking for any sign of news of Shigaraki's death or the consequences thereof for Izuku. So far, he hadn't found any news about the villain's death, which was surprising. But, the League of Villains might be keeping the news close to the chest so they could pay Izuku back first. The police hadn't released any news on it yet, and they probably didn't intend to. Keeping it a secret meant the League didn't get any publicity, which was probably a good thing. Around 10.30, he was about to crash when his phone rang. Eraserhead had given him a new phone, since they'd confiscated his own as evidence, or whatever. Boot, they failed to find his work phone. Speak, Izuku grumbled, a bit tiredly. Where the hell have you been? Jurin, Izuku checked his phone. Yep, that was Jurin's number, saved in his phone, too. Why the hell was the underground's biggest supplier? Informant calling him at 10.30 on a Wednesday night. Yes, headless freak, Jurin. Where the FCK are you? Ui looked around his UA dorm room and clicked his tongue. I decided to go back to school. Jurin's barking laughter filled the speaker. Ah, uh, whatever. I don't need to know what madness you're up to. Look, I've got a job for you. I'm a little busy, Jurin. Like dot 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 can't really get away, kind of busy. We both know that's bullshit. So, here's the deal, this slimy bastard. Overhaul, he's a real piece of work, even for a villain. His quirk lets him literally overhaul a person. Like rip them apart from the inside out and reform them into. 
It's nasty. Anyway, Jiren ranted about the man's germophobia and OCD for a while. Izuku tuned back when he got to the point. So this FC Kerr has two kids he's using for experiments to make some FC cat up drugs and weapons. He, what? Izuku's voice slipped into a darker overtone. He could almost hear Jiren shiver on the other end of the receiver. Izuku's brain snapped into protective mode. His hand gripped the phone a little tighter. Some bastard was keeping kids and using his quirk to make weapons out of them. Absolutely FC King not. Jiren knew Izuku's viewpoint on child abuse, views he had for very good reasons. The supplier had called him for a reason. He's got a little girl with a rewind quirk. It's like a remote. You just turn it on and rewind anything, anyone. The boy dot 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 his quirk is dot 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 a, a lot like yours. Like mine. How? You're not much for chit chat, are ya, ghosty? Call me that again and you won't have a tongue to chit chat with, beach. Fine, fine. Be a grumpy little spook. Whatever. Look, the boy turns into a big old black wolf but his quirk's got something to do with some old myth of a guardian. Izuku had done extensive research into English, Gaelic, and Scandinavian myths when he was starting to understand his own quirk. After all, he was basically a fae himself. He'd certainly read myths about guardian wolves before, but he'd need to see this boy's quirk first before making assumptions as to which myth it was based around. Text me the address. I've got time. I knew you weren't that busy. Oh, the girl's name is Eri, the boy is Koda. They're a package deal from what the guards say. Never separate unless that bastard is using his quirk on them. You know what I'm going to ask next, Jiren. That wasn't the supplier's real name. Izuku knew that. But he did want Overhaul's true name. He really really wanted it. He'd never wanted another person's name quite as much as he wanted this name. Kai Chizaki. True. Izuku grinned. Oh, I'm sending along a friend, backup. Izuku frowned. I work alone, Jiren, you know that. This one's going to be tough. Their place is built like a fortress. For once, trust me, please. Fine. Izuku sighed. Who? Nagant. Lady Nagant. She's in Tartarus. Are you sure about that? Izuku didn't even want to know what that was supposed to mean. There was no telling how Lady Nagant broke out. And judging from the non-existent chatter about it, he was going to assume no one yet knew she was even out. That meant it was likely the doing of someone very high up in the food chain. And Izuku did not want to know what kind of drama that would stir in the already messy pot. Whatever, he could use a good sharpshooter anyway. Izuku was a close-range fighter. Having someone covering his ass might be useful for once. What do I owe you for this lovely package deal? Nothing. This was repayment. Our books are clear, yeah. Jiren owed him for a few specialty weapons Izuku was able to liberate for Jiren's clientele. He'd owed Izuku for quite a while now. But this dot 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 this seemed like an appropriate repayment. MMM, agreed. I'll text you the address. Izuku hung up. He always hung up first. And he usually cut Jiren off, too. It was not only a habit, but part of his vigilante persona. A moment after he tossed his phone on the desk, it buzzed with a text message. Jiren was true to his word. Almost always. Izuku quickly changed into his vigilante gear. Black cargo pants with a nice black dress shirt and a dark green silk tie. It was a bit of a shock they let him keep it, but there really wasn't a reason to take the regular clothes. His combat boots were still shiny enough, so he strapped them on and grabbed his overcoat on the way out the door. He grabbed a simple black medical mask to cover the bottom half of his face and flipped the hood up on his coat as he walked out of his room with his phone in hand and whip strapped to his hip. They had taken his whip and knives, but Nedzu had snuck them into his dorm room yesterday with nothing but a little mouse smiley face on a piece of paper taped to a knife handle. Nedzu likely knew a day like this would come. There was no real way to keep Izuku inside the school unless he wanted to remain, so the least they could do was make sure he had defensive weapons dot 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 or offensive weapons. Both were preferable. He did grab his school phone as well, just in case. 45 minutes later, Izuku was crouched on the outer wall of the Yakuza hideout. FC King Jiren. Not telling him Overhaul was the leader of the only remaining sect of Yakuza in the city. Izuku sighed to himself. Welp, here goes another suicide retrieval mission, right? What a damn shame. Still, Jiren knew Dullahan would never refuse a job that involved weird quirks and kids. If there was one thing Izuku was, it was predictable in terms of his morals, what he stood for. No one in the underground knew he was some abused quirkless child. But if they did, maybe they'd understand why he was up on this damn wall, waiting for his backup to arrive. He didn't have to wait long. The soft clack of boots announced Nagin's arrival. He didn't offer to help her get up the wall. She was perfectly capable of that herself. She actually did a flip off a nearby tree and landed beside his crouched form. Bright white boots shining in the moonlight to his left. Dolahan, Nagant. Oh, what a lovely night for a break-in. The woman plopped herself down on the wall. 
crossed her legs, and started twisting her dual-colored hair into bullets. Izuku had read her file on one of his excursions in the commission's database. Don't ask how he managed to get access to that. It was not something he was going to repeat. Using his quirk to bypass electronic and digital locks was mind-bogglingly stupid and incredibly painful. Never again. Lady Nagant was basically Hawks, but from a slightly older generation. She was groomed, trained, and made into a popular pro-hero by the Hero Commission. But the first time she questioned their orders, she was punished, stripped of her title, and thrown into Tartarus prison for a crime she didn't commit. How'd you get out, anyway? Thought they threw that key away years ago. Izuku grumbled. He wasn't unhappy to have her here, quite the opposite, actually. But he was suspicious. MMMM. That's a long story. The short version would be that I did stay in a favor when we were teenagers. We grew up together. Anyway, it took him a long ass time to find the right quirk. Well, he found someone who can duplicate bodies. And the duplicate won't die or return to goop unless it's fatally wounded. So, you have a double in prison for you. Isn't that twice his quirk? He's with the league, right? Yeah, took a handsome penny to get me out, but Stain owed me big time. So, here we are. Jiren said there's some kids being abused in here. And he wants the research. Izuku chuckled. MMM, why am I not surprised? I'm sure he figured I'd burn it all down. Bingo, kid. Izuku rolled his eyes and stood up. He flicked his overcoat out behind himself and unstrapped his whip and hunting knife, one in each hand. So what's with this whole dot 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 dark and moody aesthetic? I'm not hip on the new vigilante style these days. You supposed to be some old world mysterious spook or something. Headless horseman. She blinked. Izuku grinned behind his mask. Stay on my ass. I hope your aim's still good. I'd prefer not to get shot tonight. Insult my aim again and you might just get a bullet in the ass anyway. That would prove me right, though. Nagant laughed. Her arm snapped backwards as she loaded a bullet made of twisted hair into the chamber and peeped the rifle to ready it for firing. Just as Izuku was about to jump down into the backyard, his phone buzzed in his pocket. Oh, great, that was his school phone. The scream lit up their faces and Nagant even leaned over to check who it was. Oh, shit, Eraserhead's calling. I was rooting for him when he was at UA. I hear he's the best underground hero, you better get that. Izuku declined the call. Did you just, did you just send Eraserhead to voicemail? Yep. You can't ghost Eraserhead. Hey, kid, wait. Izuku jumped off the wall, landing silently in the darkened garden. Nagant landed beside him. Izuku was not in the mood to speak with Eraserhead. Plus, he was sort of busy right now. There was the consideration that his phone likely had a tracker in it, but he wasn't particularly worried about that right now. He had a job to do. They both turned and nodded to each other once. Izuku went to the right and Nagant to the left so they could come at the back door from opposite angles. Just as they approached the dimly lit porch, a guard walked out with a lit cigarette already in hand. He was entirely unaware of their presence. Nagant signaled to him from across the patio. I'll distract. Knock him out. It wasn't sign language. It was a form of combat language that heroes used. Izuku was glad he thought to learn it young, when he'd wanted to be a hero. He nodded, agreeing with her plan. Hey Bozo. She stopped into the light and pointed her gun at the guy's face. What the Izuku wrapped his whip around the man's neck and tugged, yanking him off his feet and backwards until he was in the crook of Izuku's elbow and suffocating. It took all of ten seconds and the guy was out cold, but still breathing. Izuku drug him backwards into the bushes, he'd be out for a while. He should have stopped to grab some zip ties but there weren't any hardware stores open this late anyway. Jiren gave me the rundown on the Shai Hasekai, that's what they're calling themselves now. This one is Yu Hojo, his quirk is crystallized. Good, I was not keen to go in blind, but I often do. Izuku walked over to the back door and waved his hand to the lock. He didn't need to wave his hand, but it often misled people, so he did it out of habit. The lock clicked and he opened the door. The hell is your quirk? Nagant asked, following him into the low light of the hallway. They were whispering, barely audible over the buzz and hum of fluorescent lighting in the ceiling. Dullahan, that's her name. Not your she pivoted on her heel, her gun immediately in the face of a weirdly short guy with a damn bag over his head. The bagged head tilted, large eyes blinked, but he didn't move. All three parties stared each other down for five seconds. When the bag-headed guy's hand moved, Nagant's arm clicked and another rifle tip appeared. She fired. The bullet went right through the center of the guy's head. He collapsed with a soft thud, dead. So, she had a suppressor on her rifle, interesting. The crack of the bullet had been no louder than someone popping their lips. Hmm, well, I was going to try and be light on killing tonight. I really don't need another felony on my list. Izuku muttered. Ah, let me do the killing. She smirked. Besides, I'm the felon, right? Well, your file was bullshit. If that's to be believed, you were never a felon. I commend your commitment to the role the commission assigned you, though. The woman snorted. She quickly twisted and loaded another bullet then motioned for him to lead on. Good, she knew her role. She would cover his ass and he would get them to their goal. 
Izuku peeked in a nearby room and grabbed the bag-headed guy before he could bleed all over the floor and shoved him into the closet he found. Then, he moved a rug over the stains and called that good for now. Basement level. We need the labs. It shouldn't be heavily guarded at this time of night, but we may encounter more shy Hisekai. Those two were in the eight bullets, his most powerful enforcers. I'd very much like to find overhaul. We don't have time for that. Nagant insisted. Oh, I only need enough time to say his name. Izuku pushed onward with Nagant right on his heels. This time, she chose not to ask questions about his quirk or why he said such weird things. It was probably for the best anyway. She'd only be left with more questions. They took a detour down a hallway when some random thugs passed by, probably on night watch. They were low level, not worth the time it would take to dispose of them, and since there are three, it would also be harder to control them, meaning they'd risk the element of surprise. Nagant motioned to a section of wall with a cutout and a little flower pot. She whispered that's it. What's it? That's the door. Izuku shrugged. They waited for the thugs to pass down the hall and approach the door. Sure enough, when Izuku stood before it, the door unlocked and the wall opened inward. Well, wasn't that interesting, a secret door. Izuku would have been looking for a big vault door in a hideout like this, but perhaps this kind of door was better camouflage. Regardless, they shut the door behind themselves and scurried quietly down the stairs to the basement with no further resistance. The basement was, quite literally, a lab environment. A dozen or so study rooms with varying tools and equipment. He could tell one room was most certainly a genetics lab, or at least served as a discount one. The basement was one big T-shape. The labs were along the long hallway they came down, with a cross section at the end. The left was what appeared to be some kind of testing chamber for weapons. He'd seen some of that equipment in forensic shows when they shot bullets into various synthetics for testing. To the right were locked cells. The largest, at the end, had a large window in the wall. Inside, he found two children. Neither could have been older than ten, and that was pushing it. A young girl with white hair, red eyes, and a little horn on her forehead, sat laughing and smiling on one of two beds in the room. The boy had brown hair and a fake scowl, dramatized as he marched across the room like a dinosaur. They approached the room slowly, but given there was no reaction from their arrival at the window, Izuku assumed this was a two-way mirror. He found some strange familiarity in that boy. It was like seeing a long-lost cousin at a family reunion after years apart. You knew they were your family, but you couldn't remember their name. For the second time, his school phone buzzed in his pocket. Actually, when he took it out, he realized he had several missed calls from Eraserhead. Oh he's gonna kill you. Izuku rolled his eyes and answered the call. Ghost, you better hope to every god that might exist I don't activate the tracker on your phone that's probably not a good idea right now, Eraser. You, answered, MHM. The two kids in the cell were now playing with a board game on the bed, and they looked wide awake, which was weird for how late it was. Sadly, Izuku figured that was because they were trapped underground. Their bodies didn't have a proper circadian rhythm anymore. That was not good for children so young. Where the hell are you? Don't you dare say you're out there trying to capture villains. I swear to every god, I will drag your ass back to this school. I am most certainly not out capturing villains. That was not a lie. It just wasn't the whole truth. Oh well, he did his best. We really shouldn't be standing here like sitting ducks, kid. Who was that? No one, eraser. I'm busy. I need to go. I'll be back to school soon. Oh, and I'm bringing a couple new students. Tell Nedzu I'm pulling the one condition he owes me. Goes click. Nagant had to stifle her laughter in her hand. Jiren said you always do that. It's so rude. Maybe, but it's effective. Come on. Izuku approached the door. He could feel the lock trying to fight him, which was a new experience. So, it must be treated with some kind of quirk-resistant material, or made of quirk-resistant metal. Those were new materials, and primarily used in super expensive buildings and hero schools for safe training. Still, nothing could resist the call of the Dullahan, and eventually, the lock clicked and Izuku opened the door without much effort. Nagant stood in the doorway with her foot out to make sure the door didn't close and her gun arm pointed down the hall. Both children looked up with fear in their eyes. The reaction was almost instant. The young boy jumped across the room, and mid-jump, his body twisted and transformed into a large black wolf with glowing red eyes that appeared out of a misty black smoke. Uh, Izuku crouched down, bowing his head. Hello, little Grim. He greeted, in an effort to show he meant no harm, or perhaps that he was like them. Izuku put a hand on both sides of his head and with a familiar crack, he pulled his head from his neck and held it under his arm while watching the two children. The girl was cowering behind the bed while the boy, Wolf was in a defensive stance, growling at the strangers. Those big red eyes softened when he realized what Izuku was, though. He might not have ever been told about the Dullahan, but beasts of death knew each other, or perhaps he had assumed they did. After all, Izuku had recognized the child from a distance, even if they'd never met before. The wolf tilted its head and plopped down on its butt with a soft awoo. 
as if asking who Izuku was. Izuku took that as his permission to replace his head. So he did. Thankfully, Nagant didn't turn around until he'd managed to crack his neck back into place. We don't have all night, kid. I'm aware of that. Calm down. He looked back to the wolf and offered out his hand. I am Dullahan. We are quite alike. You and I we are both heralders of death and guardians of the afterlife. Do you know your name? The wolf chuffed. Izuku took that as a no. You are a church grim. What a beautiful coat you have. The wolf sniffed his outstretched hand and eventually nuzzled his head under it. Good. He stood up and looked across the room. Yuri was hiding behind the bed, with only the top of her head and her eyes peeking over it. The moment Izuku looked over to her, the wolf jumped across the room and curled up around her protectively. It's alright. We're here to rescue you. We're going to take you far away from the as the bad man who hurt you. He was trying so hard not to let his usual sass and vulgarity come through when talking to a couple of scared kids. That wouldn't help at all. The girl whimpered. The wolf nuzzled his snout under her arm. A moment later, he began shrinking, his form returning to the young boy he was moments ago, with his arms wrapped around the girl. It's okay, Ari. He's like me. He's safe. Safe? She asked, the tension in her shoulders releasing a little. We need to leave. Izuku insisted, still holding out his hands. We're going somewhere safe, away from this awful place. But you need to come now, before the guards come back. But Ari, please. The boy picked her up. Or well, he tried to. He was only slightly bigger than her, like a year or two older. I'll keep you safe. Get on my back, like when we play, okay? She took an agonizingly long moment to think about it, but finally, she nodded. Izuku sighed in relief. Once more, the boy jumped over the bed, transforming into a wolf, but he wasn't simply a wolf. Izuku finally noticed it now that he was closer. His tail whisked behind him, as if it faded into black smoke, rippling and foggy. It was beautiful, almost dizzying to watch. His eyes were bright red. They glowed like Eraserhead's quirk but it felt more like hellfire than power. The wolf knelt down, front paws on the ground, and he climbed onto his back. The dog huffed. Let's go. He ordered Nagant. The woman rushed back into the hallway with Izuku right behind her, and Iri atop her wolf by his side. Izuku wished he had a way to leash the wolf, if only so he could keep them close. He could use his whip but that would likely only upset the kids. He just didn't want to lose them. Izuku was certain there was no way they were getting out of this mess without running into trouble. But Izuku was not leaving here without as they approached the stairs. Someone was taking each step one by one, slowly. White sneakers approached them, followed by a man wearing a dark green jacket with purple feathered trim and, of all things, a plague doctor mask. What the FCK? He stopped just behind Nagant. Oh shit, he quickly placed his hands over Eri's ears. The girl winced a little but didn't pull away. Who the shit is that? He growled at Nagant. That's overhaul. The moment he appeared in the light of the hallway, Eri buried her whole body into the back of her wolf. Koda took an angry stance, growling at the man approaching them with all his teeth bared. Well, well, what's this? I spy two big rats, dirtying up my clean stock. What a mess. Overhaul sighed, and slowly peeled off the glove on his right hand. Izuku immediately realized it was another five-point activation quirk. There was zero way he was allowing that hand to touch any of them tonight, especially not after taking Shigaraki's decay to the arm. The man tutted his tongue, like an upset English teacher. Izuku's left eye twitched. This man reminded him far too much of one of his teachers back in middle school. The cruelties of them all, really. Tachiro sensei liked smacking a ruler on Izuku's knuckles when he was too loud. He'd go so far as to make them bleed. Too loud consisted of, writing, breathing, thinking, and existing. Do the rats have anything to say before I clean up the mess they've left in my immaculate house? Nagant's arm raised, pointed directly at Overhaul's head. Don't move. I have no issue putting a bullet through your head. Overhaul had the gall to walk right to the tip of her gun, inches from touching his forehead to the barrel. Izuku assumed that wouldn't actually happen, if only because the man was far too horrified at the idea of germs to touch another person without his quirk active. Why? Izuku asked. Everyone looked at him. His tone was empty, void of emotion, but he was slowly slipping into that multi-tone call he reserved only for those he called to death. Why did you kidnap these children and keep them? This grim is my kin. And? The kid was orphaned. Parents were killed by some psycho villain. No one cared if a little wolf wandered off and never came home. Cry me a river. Are you his uncle or something? No. Izuku brushed a hand over Iri's head to soothe her before stepping around Nagan. I am Dolahan. Ah, the faceless vigilante with morals. I should have known. I heard you were dead. Lost your head when the heroes tried to capture you. You know someone tried to pay me to capture you. Overhaul your mouth shut. I would love to know what's so dangerous about your voice. It's not my voice you should worry about. Izuku motioned for Nagan to stand back. She took only two steps back and guarded the kids while standing sideways to watch both ends of the hallway, just in case. It's the intent behind the words. You're just a kid. What intent could you possibly have? Overhaul laughed openly for a moment. 
Then, he peeled the other glove off his hand and tossed them aside. Whatever, I don't care. I'll do what the underground wants and collect the reward. When the hand grabbed for Izuku, the teen slipped away by crouching under his arm and spinning to the side. However, Hall groaned in frustration as he grabbed the wall to rebalance himself. Tell me why you did this, and I won't hurt you. Hurt me, Overhaul snorted, as if, you're just a stupid teenager, as if you're any danger to me. Izuku sighed as he dodged another grab attempt. Izuku was tired of this. Overhaul was never going to explain himself, not to Izuku at least. So, there was no real reason to continue this conversation or this fight. Stop moving, Overhaul growled. You stupid brat. Izuku stopped moving, but not because of the order. The villain stumbled to the side, caught himself, then charged at Izuku. Kai Chizaki. One single heartbeat, then nothing. The light faded from his eyes. His body crumpled to the ground, sliding to a stop at Izuku's feet from its running momentum. Izuku sighed. What a waste of life. That quirk was so powerful, it could have been used for great things. And yet, he was using it to hurt people. What dot 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 the hell dot 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 did you just do? Oh, right, he wasn't alone. Izuku shrugged to Nagant. It doesn't matter. Let's go. Oh no, absolutely not. We're not just waltzing out of here after you just dot 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 said his damn name. And he died, and not address this. Yes, we absolutely are. So either move, or I will make you move. Don't forget, I read your file. I know your name, too. The shiver that ran down the woman's spine was visible. She looked between him and the wolf, unsure what to do with them now that she was realizing they were more alike than they seemed. Izuku smiled behind his mask. Get the damn research. We're leaving. Izuku's molten tone left no room for argument. Nagant moved. She bolted into the labs and quickly began downloading the files on the computers while flicking her eyes back to Izuku every so often. Their incursion had been silent thus far. No alarms, no running guards. So Izuku took the time to kneel beside the wolf and check on Iri. The girl was still cowering in the scruff of her companion's furry neck. Izuku brushed a hand through her hair. In that moment, he realized Iri wasn't her real name, or perhaps not her whole name. Kota's wasn't full either, but he could tell Kota was true, so maybe he would continue to call the wolf Grim instead. It's okay, you're safe now. He can never hurt you again. You're sure? Iri asked. Kota turned his head to nuzzle into Iri's face and the girl giggled. Yes, Iri, I'm sure. I made sure he can't hurt you ever again. Kota turned his head back to the body of Overhaul on the ground. His ears perked up like he caught sight of something. Izuku checked the hallway. There was nothing there, no one coming. He didn't feel any eyes on him. Kota sniffed, his head tilted up. Then, his muzzle opened and he let out a low growling howl. It was quiet enough that Izuku wasn't worried about someone hearing them from upstairs. But Izuku wondered what Kota saw that he couldn't. Maybe he'd ask later. Nagant scurried back out of the labs, her gun pointed at the stairs. I got it, let's go. The trip back out of the hideout was relatively uneventful. They had to knock out a couple thugs, and even one of the eight bullets. But silence and surprise was their advantage and they didn't get into a real fight. Izuku was not going to count their blessings until they were back at Yue, and he was adding one more name to the list of people he was likely going to face consequences for killing. But that was a concern for tomorrow Izuku. Tonight Izuku was worried about getting these two children back to Yue, to safety. This is where we part ways, kid. Nagant dropped down off the wall and waved the little flash drive beside her face. I got what I came for, and so did you. With Overhaul dead, the Yakuza is defunct in Japan. Jiren will be happy about that. Though, don't expect to rest easy if the what's left of the shy Hesekai find out it was your quirk that killed their leader. I'll add him to the list. Izuku grumbled. Oh, I'd love to know how long that list is. You really should stop burning bridges, kid. You're still standing on M. She flicked his forehead and skipped off into the darkness. She was gone in a couple blinks and Izuku turned back to the two children who were looking at him with wonder and fear. As to burning bridges, Izuku didn't truly believe he could die by fire. Not anymore at least. Burning a few bridges with himself atop the flames didn't sound that bad, or scary, really. But he had other problems to worry about right now. Come, he pointed towards his side. Kota was quick to pick up his walking pace and match it so they were shoulder to knee on the walk back to Yue. I'm likely going to be in trouble for this rescue, but I don't really care. No child deserves to be tortured. Or you? Uri asked. Tortured? Izuku nodded. Similarly, but not exactly the same. For me, it was my friends who turned on me, my own family. But like you, the reason was for something I could not control. Chisaki-sama said we were cursed. Izuku stopped. Kota skid to a stop beside him. Don't you dare ever think that way. Whatever he told you was a lie. You are not cursed. Quirks are tools, and we as humans have to choose how to use those tools, for good or evil. Overhaul used his to harm you, he was the cursed one. There were so many expletives Izuku wanted to scream at the sky, but he knew neither of these kids would understand his rage. He lied. But he's gone now, you won't ever be hurt again. Promise, Iri asked. Kota whined, agreeing. Izuku nodded again. 
I promise. When Izuku arrived back at the school gates, Iri put her arms up. Izuku picked her up and settled her on his hip. They'd had a quiet conversation on their walk back. The walk took them a lot longer than when Izuku was running across the roofs. Almost two hours. They were all exhausted. Along the way, he found out that Iri is seven and Kota is nine. Kota had become Iri's guardian. He'd picked her. Izuku figured that meant as a guardian church grim. He was likely saying that Iri was his chosen church to guard. Not all church grims guarded churches, after all. Some guarded people, or other buildings, or even grave sites. So that was settled. These two were a package deal. There was no pulling them apart. If someone tried, Kota's grim instincts would likely go into hyperdrive. He'd quite easily burn the world down to get his person back. Izuku understood, in a way. If there was someone whose name screamed in his soul so loudly he had to call it, there would be nothing on this earth that could stop him from claiming that soul for death. Kota shook himself off like a wet dog, despite being dry. His body flipped sideways, warped, and the child once more appeared from the black smoke of his wolf body that vanished into the mist. What a curious transformation. Dolahan, you can call me Ghost. Little Grim, can you call me Kota, then? Names of power. I don't want to accidentally hurt you. Would you prefer a different nickname? Kota shook his head. Grim is fine. Is that what I am? The myth of the church Grim is quite old. Big black wolves or dogs with bright red eyes. They guard churches, or grave sites, or even people. Yes, you are a church grim, but you can call yourself whatever you want. Chisaki-sama called him a werewolf. Iri was curled under Izuku's chin, speaking quietly. MMMM, I see why, but no, that's not quite right. You are like me, little grim. Ghost, Iri asked. Izuku looked down. What about my name? You tell me, dear. My quirk tells me when a name is true. Yours is not. You don't identify as Iri. It's what Chisaki-sama called me, but it never fit right. I like it, though. Then keep it. It's okay if you like a name, even if you don't like the person who gave it to you. Maybe someday she would identify as Iri. For now, Izuku decided he'd find her a nickname, too, just in case. Iri smiled and hugged him tightly. She was getting tired. It was almost morning. Izuku needed to get inside before sunrise, if only to be cautious. The gate opened, but Izuku didn't open it. There, standing behind the gate, was a very aggravated-looking eraser head, with Nezu sitting atop his left shoulder. The little chimera was wearing the brightest smile. Kota hid behind his legs with one hand on the bottom of Iri's shift. They were both wearing hospital scrubs but Iri's were in the form of a long hospital gown where Kota's was atop in pants. It's okay, that's eraser head and Nezu. They're heroes. What's a... Iri yawned. Hero. The look on Eraserhead's face softened the instant he saw the two children clinging to Izuku's body. He probably thought Izuku was out capturing villains and annoying the police and heroes. But tonight, Izuku was more concerned with saving children who'd been treated like he was growing up. Who's this? Nedzu asked. Am I to assume this will be your one condition? Izuku nodded. This is Iri. He bounced the girl in his arm, but only enough to gesture to her. And behind me is Little Grim. He can tell you his name. And Koda, are you sure we're safe here, ghost? I'm sure. You kids are safe here. Eraserhead walked over and ushered them all in after checking the area outside the gates. Though I'd prefer to know if that safety comes with a target, ghost. It doesn't. The person who hurt them can't hurt them anymore. We need to have a real talk when these little ears are asleep. Come on, let's get them back to the dorms. Nedzu hopped down and walked beside Koda. The young boy took the chimera's hand but never left Izuku's side. I'll have Cementos make an extra room in the dorms. For now, they can stay with Izuku. I'm sure he doesn't mind. Not at all. Thank you, Nedzu. Awkward silence was the perfect description for their walk back to the dorms. It was about four in the morning, so the campus was dark and quiet. Iri had fallen asleep in his arms and Kota had pulled his shirt up over his mouth in a continued effort to hide while he clung to Izuku's overcoat as they walked. Having forgone Nedzu's hand after a while, Eraserhead seemed to be having a tough debate with himself, his facial expressions changing every few seconds. Nedzu just wore that damn smile the whole time. By the time they made it back to the dorms, Eraserhead had to pick up Kota as he was just about asleep on his feet. Poor kids. Izuku felt bad for stealing them in the dead of night, but that was the safest option, and also when his quirk worked the best. Thankfully, no one came to meet them at the door. Oddly, one of their classmates, the one Katsuki called Eye Bags, was sitting on the couch reading with a mug of coffee in hand. He didn't react more than to look up, arch his eyebrow, and smirk before returning to his business. Izuku had been told this one, Shinso was Eraserhead's other private student. They'd yet to really meet except in passing during meals and classes. But again, Izuku had only been here two days, and they had yet to have physical training that week. Izuku settled Iri into his bed once he reached his own room. Exhaustion was starting to take hold of him as well. Izuku was still getting accustomed to living life on the average person's day-night cycle. Kota rubbed his eyes and yawned. I can stay with Iri. Of course, little Grim. 
Izuku took him from a racer and placed him on the bed. In a whiff of smoke, the wolf appeared once more and curled himself around the girl. They almost looked like a yin-yang sign, white hair on black fur. Izuku smiled. When he tucked them in and turned, he found a racer head staring. Izuku patted his shoulder. Come on, let's talk. Uh-huh. Eraser had grabbed his arm once they were out of the room and dragged him back to the common room where Nenzu was waiting. The smile was gone, and in its place was a cross-armed glare. Oh come on, seriously, Nenzu. You, too. Can I not have one person on my side? He threw his hands up. I'm on your side. Shinso called across the room, not looking up. Stay out of this, Shinso. Eraser had ordered. Don't make me give you extra laps in training. Ghost. I can accept this as the one condition I promised you. But you need to understand that we need an explanation for why you left in the middle of the night and came back with two children. Obviously we have concerns. Izuku rolled his eyes at Nenzu and walked into the kitchen to grab an apple. Well give me a FC King second to get my shit together. I did just save two abused orphans from the Yakuza, you know. You what? The racer had snatched the apple from his hand before it even got to his mouth. Hey, I was eating that. Explain. Now, Izuku growled. I got a call from a friend. You, no, scratch that. I got a call from an informant. The Yakuza were doing weird-ass experiments on those kids. I have morals. You all know my past now, where I stand on the whole torturing kids thing. We all stand in that same position, ghost. Nedzu climbed up onto the kitchen counter. Go on. Right. Look, I had time, I was awake, and it wasn't going to hurt anyone. Besides, I took out the Yakuza while I was at it. Well, most of it, I guess. The leader, Kai Chisaki. You said his name. Nedzu pointed out, worry in his tone. Yeah, he's dead. Doesn't matter if I say his name now. He's did you ghost. Eraser had put his hands on his hips like a disappointed mother. Izuku made a face. He hated that reminder of his family. Yeah, I did. He tried to overhaul my face, or whatever his gross-ass quirk is. He made a wiggly hand gesture with his hand in front of his face then snatched the apple back from his grumpy teacher and leaned on the counter next to Nedzu. Besides, what's one Yakuza boss's body compared to saving two kids? Eraser had narrowed his eyes. He shoved his phone in Izuku's face. One boss. There were two bodies found at the hideout an hour ago by police investigating the uproar, one of which had a bullet in their skulls. Wanna explain that one? Oh, that wasn't me. Then, who was it? Eraser head was losing his patience. Izuku was not. Nagant. The room froze. He could have dropped a pin on the tile floor and heard it echo across the whole building. Um, maybe he should have kept that to himself. Izuku took another bite of his apple. It echoed pretty loudly. Shinso was staring at him, but he didn't seem to get the gravity of that name. So anyway, I have two kids now, one of which is like me, which I think Eraser noticed. Church Grimm, Fay Wolf, Hizuri's guard, inseparable now. And you expect this school to house, feed, and educate them? Nedzu asked. Well, one condition. Them, they stay. But, oh mind them. After all, Grimm is going to need training in his quirk. And I think Eri will need Eraser's help in training hers. Some kind of wacky rewind thing. Super powerful. They were using her to make weapons. Weapons dot 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 out of a rewind quirk. What would that do? Izuku put up a finger, telling Eraser head to hold on. He took his phone out and dialed Jurin. The supplier picked up after two rings. What weapons were they making? I assume you had time to review the data Nagant got you. Always perfect timing, Dullahan. Izuku put the phone on speaker. So anyway, it seems like Overhaul was pulling Yuri apart, over and over, then putting her back together, to get samples for some FC Ket up. Oh shit are the kids there? Izuku told him no. FC Ket up quirked a letter bullets. They're only temporary right now, but if they kept going, it might have been hell on earth. I'll make sure this gets locked away. Frankly, if this got out, I'd be out of a job, and society would collapse. Thanks Jurin. Again, books are clear. Send me a copy of all the files. And whatever you have on overhaul and the Yakuza. Yep click. Okay. So, this overhaul guy was. Using his quirk to pull those kids apart. Nedzu asked. Yep. Right. They stay. Now then. That's resolved. Let's address the other elephant in the room. Why exactly do you have the underground's most nefarious supplier on speed dial? Let's circle back to that. Nedzu, who never. The important thing is I may now have two groups of assholes after my ass, or my head. Probably my head. You know, for killing their leaders. You're just racking up the points here, kid. The racer head sighed. Thought our deal here included you quitting your vigilante extra circulars. Oh, I never agreed to that. I said I accepted being a student here. But that wasn't me saying I would quit saving lives. The racer head sighed. If you send me to voicemail, ever again, I will personally see to it that you never get out of detention. Am I clear? Izuku mocked a salute. Yes, sir, a racer head, sir. This is your fault. The teacher glared at Nenzu. This, this is your fault. I take no responsibility for this. MMM but you agreed to teach him. I will put you on top of that fridge, Nenzu. Don't test me. You wouldn't dare. 
If this kid brings the villain underground on our heads, rat, I would dare. I would dare. Nedzu looked scandalized. The little chimera even had a paw on his chest. Izuku rolled his eyes. Enough, both of you. Honestly, play Hickory Peepori Dock some other time. I need to crash. Apparently, I have training tomorrow air today. Go argue about me in your offices. I'm going to sleep. When I call, you answer. Are we understood? Izuku waved his hand. No more running off in the middle of the damn night. Go sleep. Eraserhead took Nedzu. Izuku didn't care if they left. Went to the teacher's dorms or back to the school. He did not care. Izuku wanted sleep so bad. But there was an issue. There were currently two toddlers in his room. Great. Welp, couch it was. Izuku hopped over to the couch where Shinzo was reading and collapsed himself into the purple teen's lap. That is to say, he mostly collapsed on the couch and put his head on Shinzo's legs. Um, shhh, just go with it. You've only got two hours to sleep, you might as well stay up. Shinzo huffed as he returned to the book he was reading. It looked like some kind of shonen manga. Izuku was too tired to check. Instead, he let sleep claim him for a couple hours. Reality would have to settle in eventually. But for right now he could forget everything that happened this evening and catch up on some sleep. G.A.H. Izuku woke up to the disgusting lap of an animal tongue across his face. Grim, the dog plopped itself on its butt right in front of him and huffed. Really, this better not become a habit. Koda's head tilted to the side, confused. Izuku sighed. So you were serious about the dog? Shinzo chuckled. Yeah, that's Grim. He's dot 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 well, it's complicated. He's nine. He's a kid, when he's not a wolf. I'm going to pretend that made any sense at all. It makes about as much sense as my head being detachable. Izuku grunted as he got to his feet. I'm sorry, what? Nothing. Come on Grim. It was easy to assume the little wolf was calling him to fetch Eri, ever the guardian. Koda saddled up to his side, leading him back to his room. Izuku ruffled the fur behind his ears. Do you prefer being a wolf? Koda titled his head back, snorted, and nodded his head. Izuku took that as a yes. He did wonder why, though. Perhaps less human interaction. Izuku would have liked that, too. Uri was sitting up in bed when Izuku walked in, still rubbing her eyes. She yawned and stretched her arms above her head. Hey, chickadee. Good morning. MMM morning, ghost. Did you sleep okay? I know it's only been a few hours. I might have some extra clothes here dot 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 let's see what might fit you. Actually, Izuku found a stack sitting on his chair with a note from midnight. These should fit. There was a cute pink dress for Iri and a t-shirt and shorts for Koda. Izuku smiled. At least the teachers seemed accepting so far, even if it was last minute. Okay, I'll leave these here. Do you two know how to brush your teeth and wash up? Iri nodded. Shisaki sama wanted us to be self dot 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 uhm dot 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 safient self-sufficient. Izuku clarified. All right, let me get ready and then I'll leave you to it. I'm going to make breakfast. Come out to the kitchen when you're ready. Grim, I expect you to clean up and get dressed, too. The wolf actually rolled his eyes and pretended not to hear him. Izuku quickly got himself cleaned up and put on his school uniform. Once done, he set out to make breakfast after making sure the kids had everything they needed to get ready. It was six, class was in an hour and a half. He expected the dorms to be hopping by the time he got to the kitchen, but it turns out he was early. Shinzo was on his third cup of coffee, but this time he was at the counter with his backpack beside him. You like pancakes, insomniac? Yeah, tell me something. Why do you use Bakugo's nicknames for people? You don't seem like the type. You did slam him for calling you a slur when you walked in. Izuku grabbed the pancake mix from the cabinet and a pan before answering. My quirk. Names of power. I don't like having power over people unless it's necessary. So they were serious about the you-know-what. Let me just ask if they were serious about everything last night. Aw, oh, yep. Everything. That doesn't really explain why saying his name after his death wouldn't matter though, that's what you said, right? Izuku busied himself with mixing milk and eggs into the pancake mix powder and putting a bit of oil into the pan as it heated up. The sizzle was just right. Izuku dipped three pancakes into the pan as he debated what to tell Shinzo. In all reality, it didn't matter anymore what he said. Besides, he never really liked lying. Maybe that was part of his quirk for some strange reason. But he'd never really taken to lying, just skirting around his words in a creative way. Sort of like what he told Eraser last night about their deal. He's never actually agreed to stop being a vigilante, not in so many words. Still, he didn't like the idea of telling the whole truth. But if he did, maybe he'd make some friends dot 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 or enemies. Which was better? Ah, well, you know. If I speak someone's true name with specific intent dot 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 well, they die. He shrugged and flipped the pancakes. What, like a death curse? You know, everyone I meet has something different to say about my quirk. Kakin called it creepy pasta. They both chuckled. Anyway, yeah, death curse. My vigilante name is my quirk name. Dullahan. You ever read anything on fey myths? Not much, but I've heard of Dullahan. 
There's an old anime called Dururara in it. There's a Dullahan, her name's Kelty. Shiu, someone stole her head. Shinso paused, nervously. Can that, can that happen? MHM. Well, my head has only ever detached at night, so I'm not sure if it could happen during the day. But if someone took my head, I'd be pretty stuck. I can move my body independently but it's not perfect, and I still need my eyes to see. So your body is like a floundering fish, pretty much. I also can't speak or breathe when my head's detached, though I also can't die. So it's not like Kelty. Shinzo asked, what do you mean? Sorry, I've never seen that anime. Oh, well, her body could move and think on its own. That's how she got to Japan to look for her stolen head. Well, I mean, to be honest, I've never been without my head for more than a few minutes. I guess I just always assumed my body would have trouble without my head. I've never tried it. Izuku plated the pancakes and poured another three into the pan. Shinzo stole one and munched it plain. It doesn't bother you. Izuku asked. What? You being a dull hand? Not really. I think it's cool. Though, Kelty's motorcycle is like dot 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 her familiar. Something. They call it ooh. Coest Bodder. Izuku choked on his own spit at the pronunciation of the Celtic phrase. Oh dear. Poist Bodhar. It's ooh, what's the term? Stage coach. No, death coach. Sorry, I'm bad with translation. Anyway, they're silent coaches, often led or driven by the Dullahan. No, I don't have one. I've never really tried to find one. Considering it's just a myth, I always figured I just never had the luck of finding whoever has coist Bodhar for a quirk. Even if I did, well, I wouldn't think it'd be appropriate to call them a familiar. Shinso nodded a few times and stole another pancake. Or he tried to. Izukai smacked his hand with the spatula. Oh, hey, what's your deal? Those are for the kids. Not you. You asked if I liked pancakes. I'll make you some afterary and little grim meat. Speaking of them, the little wolf silently paraded himself into the kitchen with Iri on his back. Izuku got a laugh out of that. Iri was in the pink dress he'd left. And hopefully Koda was all cleaned up behind his wolf mist. What smells good? Iri asked. Pancakes, that your new dad won't let me have. Izuku glared at Shinso. I am not a father. He pointed the spatula at the taller teen. We're not doing that. You're the one who adopted two kids last night, on a whim. It wasn't a fuck. It wasn't a whim. They needed help. I helped. Whatever you say, teen dad. Move over. I'll plate while you cook. Izuku sighed. But he was right. Izuku had just adopted two kids on a damn whim. Uri was still half asleep, clearly not having gotten enough. Izuku felt that exhaustion in his bones. Koda was tilting his head back, nuzzling Uri's leg to try and wake her up. It wasn't working very well. Shinso joined him at the counter and started plating pancakes. The girl held up her hands, asking to be picked up, so Izuku grabbed her and put her back on his hip like last night. He was sure the poor girl was terrified of her new surroundings, but she was just too tired to process that right now, so she clung to the only thing that felt familiar. Izuku and Koda were the same kind of creature. She must sense it. As Shinso got a plate ready for Koda, Izuku fed her a pancake while he cooked. Hey, could you pour them some apple juice dot 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 or wait, can wolves have apple juice? Izuku asked. I don't know. He's not really a normal wolf, is he? I don't know what he can eat or drink. Should he have had pancakes? Izuku sighed. I don't know. It's not like my mother ever allowed me any animals. And he's not exactly a regular wolf, as you said. The aforementioned wolf huffed angrily. The mist swirled and plumed around him, reappearing the child that was inside a moment later. You could just ask, you know. Kota grumbled. The kid went to the fridge himself and grabbed the bottle of apple juice. Then, expertly, he pushed the counter stool over and climbed up to reach the cabinets and get two plastic cups out. Skillfully, the nine-year-old poured two cups and handed one to Uri in Izuku's arms. Thank you. She smiled. Kota grunted in reply. Izuku and Shinso shared a look. Trauma often makes people grow up way too fast. Izuku knew that all too well, and from the look in Shinzo's eyes, he knew it too. Katsuki had mentioned Shinzo's quirk in passing. Brainwashing. Izuku imagined he didn't have a good childhood with a quirk like that. Actually, he wondered if Eraser had also had a rough childhood because of his quirk. Maybe he should ask. Maybe he shouldn't. When Izuku turned around, the wolf was back, like a shadow beside him. He was going to have to get used to that. The second cup was already in the sink. Empty, along with the plate they'd given the little Grim. Izuku was just about to stuff a pancake in his mouth when the whole dorm roused to life with the thundering of students' feet coming down the stairs. It was a slow trickle at first. Then suddenly the whole common room was awash in life and his brain was going haywire from all the observation pings. Shinso moved around him and grabbed another pancake from the plate to stuff in his mouth. He shot Izuku a sly grin. They worked on cleaning up the kitchen as their classmates streamed around them. Ada and Momo both grabbed protein bars while discussing the English paper due at the end of the week. Takoyami and Koda came down chatting quietly while inspecting Takoyami's Nintendo Switch. Sue came hopping, literally, down the stairs and grabbed herself a bowl of cereal. 
all of this, and more, until Katsuki came thundering down the steps and stopped dead in his tracks at the sight of Izuku and Shinzo munching on pancakes with a girl sitting on the counter and a black wolf leaning on Izuku's leg. Izuku didn't stop munching his breakfast while the blonde glared at him. He was expecting an answer, but none came. Then, someone screamed. It wasn't a scream of fear, though. It was a cry of elation. Mina rounded the corner and squealed when she caught sight of the kids. Or well, the one kid in the dock. Oh my god. Aizawa sensei let us have a dock. The girl scurried towards them. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Izuku mumbled. Hum, why not? He's not a pet. Izuku placed Uri on Koda's back. The wolf huffed at Mina and shook its head. Long black plumes of misty smoke ruffled around his neck in the action. Large red eyes lifted to face the pink teen. She stepped back. The rest of the class finally noticed. Ghost, it's highly irregular to have a canine in the dorms. Did you even pass this by Aizawa sensei? He knows, class prees. Grim is here to stay, so is Iri. Who's oh? Koda rounded the kitchen counter with Iri riding on his back. He walked right to the door and sat down. Iri rested her chin atop Koda's head, and Izuku's heart just absolutely burst. That was the cutest thing ever. The dog gestured his head to the door, barked once, and settled down on his stomach. Someone better start talking. Katsuki rubbed his face. Right now. It's fine, Kakin. They're just staying for a while. But I don't believe Iri likes all the attention. Can we all just take a breath and calm down? We are calm. Momo stepped around Ida. Hello there. I'm yeah Momo. But you can call me Momo. Okay. Iri nodded, still hiding in the misty fluff of her guardian's neck. I'm Ijiru Kirishima. Where did the redhead come from? Izuku was still not used to having so many people around him. I'm Mina, it's so lovely to meet you. Hey, I'm Achako Yuraraka. One by one, the whole class started introducing themselves. No one approached the toddler duo, likely because of Izuku's warning. Once they'd all said their names, Izuku felt a frustrated twitch in the back of his head. Names, power. He hated that burning acid in the back of his throat. Shaking his head, he tossed the spatula in the sink and grabbed his backpack. Sincho followed suit and they headed for the door. Koda was on his feet in an instant and found his place at Izuku's side. Ghost. Katsuki called. Izuku stopped. HM. You're not going to explain why we all just woke up to a toddler and a wolf in the dorms like it's a normal Wednesday morning. It is a normal Wednesday morning. We're about to be late for class. Sensei is not going to be happy about that. That's what got the students in gear. They rushed around Izuku like a flood, which he got a huge kick out of. Mostly because they all gave him pleasant good mornings or patted the mound of curls atop his head in passing. The more shy of his classmates bowed their heads or smiled. But it meant the same.